the stature of the fullness of Christ. Follow this. Next verse. You will love the next verse. Till we all come. No, next verse. Verse 14. Verse 14. That we henceforth. Ephesians 4.14. That we henceforth. Be no more tossed to and fro. And carried about. See that? Tossed to and fro. To and fro. No stability. Within five years, you've been to ten churches. Carried about. Tossed to and fro. Because you are looking for what should not be looked for. And the reason why you're looking for what should not be looked for is because nobody discipled you. You're going around looking for how to be blessed when you're already blessed. And some charlatans in the name of preachers will tell you five keys to the blessing. And of course, one of those keys is your money. And then you are busy giving money, giving everything, using all the keys. The blessing is not forthcoming because you are looking for what should not be looked for. Nobody discipled you. Nobody taught you. Nobody brought you up. Nobody paid particular attention to your spiritual growth because you were evangelized. You believed the gospel, but you were not giving attention to growth. Am I communicating? So we can't be repeating the same circle over and over. So that is why if you're going to go to evangelize in obedience to the Great Commission, the intent of evangelism is to raise disciples who will become ministers who will evangelize, to raise disciples who will become ministers to evangelize, to raise disciples who will become ministers to evangelize. So the circle goes on. And then we build a solid body that the devil has no access to. Because everybody is fortified. And everybody has the same focus. Christ, Christ, Christ. No, no, no self playing in between. Now, observe the next verse. No, hold on here. Verse 14. Those two and four carried about with every wind. Did you see? Not doctrine. It's wind. It's not doctrine. What many people have is wind. Wind in the name of doctrine. And you know what a wind does? It comes and goes. It, it's, it's not consistent. One time they will tell you COVID, COVID vaccine is antichrist. Once you take it, you have 666. After a while, it will be gone. New things will come up because there are winds. And I asked somebody, somebody said, once you take the COVID vaccine, you, have, you are going to hell. And I said, what are you talking about? How can technology destroy eternal life? The life of God in you will be destroyed by a scientific calculation. Then it was not the life of God at all. Jesus said, I give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish. None shall be able to pluck you out of my hand. My father that gave you to me is greater than all. And no one is able to take you out of my hand. So how can a scientific formulation destroy what Jesus acquired three days, three nights? It's a wind that is passing because it's not going to stand the test of time. And there are so many people that is where their theology stops at. Wind. Wind. Today they will tell you Israel, Israel, Jerusalem is where we should be looking at. Once it is in Israel and Jerusalem, that's the way God talks to the church. How, what are you talking about? Jesus broke the middle wall of partition. There's no more Jew, there's no more Gentile. Jesus destroyed all that dichotomy and brought Jew and Gentile together. And out of Jew and Gentile brought out a new kind of humanity that never existed before. The born again man is not a Jew, it's not a Gentile. It's a new kind of humanity that the earth never saw before because this born again man came out of his resurrection. I don't have to go to Israel for anything. I don't have to. If I go to Israel, I'm going on tourism. I'm not going there because there's anything in Israel. What is in Israel is in everywhere else. Their water is the same worldwide. There's nothing unique about the water in Israel. River Jordan is not unique. There's nothing on Mount Zion. I am the Zion. If you're looking for the mountain to go to, come to me. I am Mount Zion. I am the city of the living God. I am the heavenly Jerusalem. Am I talking to somebody here? These are the realities of the scripture that a believer must be taught so that he's not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind. 
Are you following? Now, watch that Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14. He now says, he says, every wind of doctrine by the sly of men and cunning craftiness. These guys are craft masters. The way they will walk your emotion with scriptures, you wouldn't know where your money leaves your pocket. Because they are craft masters. Cunning craftiness. Whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's why after a while you see believers feeling used and deceived. Because lie does not last forever. After a while, it will be exposed. Are we teaching here? Now, put, put, put your finger, if you have your Bibles open to that verse of scripture, flip with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse number 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 6. As you have therefore received, received Christ Jesus the Lord, so, walk ye in him as you have received him. The same way you received him is the same way you walk in him. How did you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord? Put your finger in Colossians, flip to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Next verse. Not of works. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By grace through faith. Not of works. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. Let's go back there again. Colossians 2 verse 6. Verse number 6. As you have received... Colossians chapter 2 verse 6, not Ephesians, Colossians chapter 2 verse 6, 6 not 7, verse 6, good. As you have, Ephesians again, <laughs> Colossians 2 6, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By grace through faith. How do you walk in him? By grace through faith. Now observe the next verse. Rooted. Rooted. Verse 7. Colossians 2, 7. Rooted and built up in him. That is the fruit of discipleship. That is what discipleship will produce. Rooted and built up. Not in church. In him, him who? Him Christ Jesus, the Lord, whom you receive. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. But look at how you will be rooted, built up, and established as you have been taught. Go teach, teaching them as you have been taught. So what do you do? Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Yeah, you abound in what you have been taught with thanksgiving. Are we teaching good this morning? Yeah, because look, you can't raise disciples if you're not, if you're not, if you're not given to teaching. You've got to teach. Look at the next verse. Oh, glory to God. Beware lest any man spoil you. After he says you'll be rooted, built up, grounded, as you have been taught, abound there. He now says, there are spoilers. You beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Through what? Idle fancies. Plain nonsense. When praises go up, blessings come down. Philosophy. Nonsense. Idle fancies. They sound fanciful, but they are empty. Don't be spoiled. Don't let anybody spoil you. Stay in what you have been taught. It can be boring. 
doctrine is boring. It's boring because it's the same thing we're saying over and over again. It's not exciting. That's why the Bible says the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. Because doctrine has to be endured, not enjoyed. Brother Paul says, <laughs> it, is, it is not grievous for me to say the same things to you. In fact, for you, it is safe. It is safe for you that every time you are hearing the same thing. We come to church and hear the, 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 the digital intestines of Lucifer. And you go like, wow, 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 this is deep. This is deep. <laughs> what is deep about the digital intestines of Lucifer? What's deep about that? Which scripture are you going to read? You know? <laughs> oh, incubus and succubus. When you start dreaming and see yourself having sex in a dream, there's a spirit called incubus. Kibus and Sikibus. You need deliverance. What? So, when such things come to you, it makes you unsure of what you have. So, that's those are the kind of people, Brother Paul, will say, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that has called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there will be some that will trouble you. They trouble you. They make you unsettled. You're not sure whether Jesus still loves you. You're not sure whether you will get to heaven. Uh, you start praying that God will qualify you for the rapture. That's another gospel. Praying for God to qualify you for rapture is another gospel. Because the moment Jesus came in you, you were qualified for rapture. It's not a prayer point. It's a reality in Christ. Am I teaching good? So you beware because there are a lot of philosophies out there. You know, I've lost touch with many of them. I will have recited them for you. But I've not been in business with them for a lot of time, in, for many years now. So I don't even remember all those crazy things. You know, I used to say them back in the days. But I, I don't remember them anymore. There are just philosophies out there. And the undiscerning becomes victims of them. You just find yourself chasing shadows and pursuing things that don't exist. They tell you to pray midnight because the reason why you pray at midnight, that is when Satan changes God. So you've got to pray at midnight so that when there's a new God of oppression, of demonic activity coming into oppression, you take charge. And they forget that in the spirit there's no time. Twelve midnight is only you that knows about that. Satan does not know that there's anything called twelve midnight. He just operates. And 12 midnight is different in different countries. <laughs> it takes an uncivilized mind to fall for that. Or a mind that has refused to think through. I'm teaching good. He says, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Idle fancies. Plain nonsense. After the tradition of what? Man. Grab a bottle of oil every night and touch your forehead before you sleep. Nonsense. If Satan wants to get at you, he will use the bottle to smack your head. Because even Satan knows that there's nothing in that bottle. You are the bottle. You are the bottle of oil. The anointing you have received of him abides in you. So when you move, the anointing moves. Christ in you, the anointed one and his anointing in you, the hope of glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. You are the bottle. You are the bottle of oil. You are the custodian of God's oil. Not just oil, you carry all of God. Oh, you're complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. Yeah. And where he's seated, you're seated. What is God? You've got. Where he is, you are. All that is his is yours. Say with me, I lack nothing. I have everything supplied for me in Christ Jesus. I thought I would have a powerful amen. 
So he says there's a tradition called a tradition of men. And Jesus said you have made the word of God of none effect by the tradition of men. So this tradition is so powerful that it could neutralize the effectiveness of God's word. That's why you should be careful. Let nobody spoil it. After the rudiments of this world are not after Christ. So anything that is not Christ-centered is a spoiling of you. Any message that is not Christ-centered is an attempt to spoil you. To make victim out of you. To put you in bondage. To deny you of your liberty in Christ. Yeah. Anything that is not Christ. He says, not after Christ. Look at the next verse. Oh, I love verse 9. He says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. <laughs> in him dwelleth all of deity. Everything that makes God, God dwells in Jesus bodily. And you are complete in him. Next verse. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all angelic beings. Principalities and powers is angelic beings, including demons and devils. Satan is an angel. He's a fallen angel. Satan is a fallen angel. And you are complete in the head over all the angelic rulers. Both positive angels and negative ones. Glory to God. So, that is why discipleship is of the essence. We disciple people in, in, an, in a, you know, with the intent of building, rooting, grounding, and establishing them in the faith. So, I won't evangelize if I do not have a plan to disciple. I must have the plan to disciple before I evangelize. And when I disciple, my discipleship is with the intent that I'm raising a minister of the gospel. So in discipleship, I begin to train you on being responsible for other people, being responsible for souls. I start watching you and, and giving you responsibilities to, to look after other people's spiritual growth. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Now, Follow this. <clears throat> so the goal of evangelism is discipleship. When I go to preach to people, what I'm doing to the audience is to enroll them in a school. When I go for evangelism, I'm just enrolling new students in a school. Every teaching of scripture is for teaching, for doctrine. The reason for the scriptures is for teaching. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is where? In Christ Jesus. And he now says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, number one, for doctrine. Number two, for reproof. So doctrine, by the scalia, will bring reproof. Reproof there is not, is not uh, rebuke. Reproof there is Bible language. It's persuasion. So the gospel is a message of faith that brings you to persuasion. Reproof there is the same word in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things so forth. The evidence. Evidence is the word for reproof. So Bible teaching will bring you to a place of evidence, conviction, persuasion. All right? Bible teaching will not only bring you to conviction and persuasion. It will bring you to correction where your mind adjusts where you unlearn to relearn. A person that is not unlearning and relearning is not undergoing Bible teaching. There's no way you will go through Bible teaching and not unlearn to relearn. Are you understanding? For example, how many of you know clapping in church is not doctrine? <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. Clapping is not doctrine. Who are you clapping for? He said, clap for Jesus. How can you clap for Jesus? You clap for Jesus, you clap for yourself, you clap for your uncle, you clap for your president, and you're clapping for, are they mates? In the Bible, when he says clap, he's actually saying mock the people. Clapping is for mockery. That's why in the New Testament, there's no teaching on clapping. Not in Acts, neither in the epistles. 
So how do we worship God in the New Testament? We lift up holy hands without doubt and wrath in our hands, in our hearts. That's how we worship God. We clap for us if we like. Because we all agree that clapping for us here within this community is to celebrate you. So we can clap because we have an understanding that is common among us. But when it comes to God, we relate with God doctrinally. And what is the doctrine for exalting and celebrating God? We lift up holy hands. Are you following what I'm teaching? But when you are not taught, you will still be clapping. Say, let's celebrate God's goodness. Bah, 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 bah. What is wrong with you? We have said the only way we celebrate God's goodness is by what? Lifting above. Your default setting will not allow you to make the adjustment because you are not learning. Because if you were learning, you will know that we don't clap for Jesus. We wave in honor. You don't worship God on your terms. You worship God on his terms. You're not the recipient of it. He is the recipient. And he has told you how to do it for him to enjoy. I don't know if I'm communicating at all. So, so but since I've been a Christian, we've been clapping. That's your problem. You've been a Christian for too long to learn new things. We all used to clap. I clap more than all of you here. I'm very sure of that. <laughs> and we clap with a degree of expertise. When we hit our hands... <laughs> where I'm coming from we didn't have musical equipment so our instrumentation was our hands and we had a rhythm with which we clap such that you will be dancing whether you like it or not but when the scriptures came alive I unlearned and relearned and I'm not clapping for Jesus anymore if I go to a church where they don't know these truths and they're clapping I don't get angry while they're clapping I'm lifting my hand because we are not the same I won't do what they are doing because they are doing it. I will do what I'm doing because I know that what I'm doing is the right thing. And I'm not going to condemn them for clapping. Because they are in ignorance. And because they are in ignorance, God overlooks. But one of the time, I teach them. And after teaching them, if they clap again, God will not overlook. <laughs> because now they are being rebellious. Because they already know. Are we teaching good? Yeah. So, so he says, you should be aware. Let no man spoil you. See? Stay rooted. Stay grounded. So now, profitable for doctrine, for reproof. And for what? Correction. Correction is adjustment. You adjust your mind. You adjust your thinking. You unlearn to relearn. And then when that happens, it will now bring you to instruction in righteousness. The word pedia where the English people got pediatrics from. Pedia means to raise up a child by the way of the mouth, which is spiritual growth. So when the process of teaching, the process of reproof, the process of correction has taken place in you, the resultant effect of that will be spiritual growth. That means you cannot grow spiritually if you are not taught. And even if you are taught, you cannot grow spiritually if you are not persuaded. And even if you're persuaded, you cannot grow spiritually if you do not unlearn to relearn. I don't know if you're following. It, the, the sequential arrangement is intentional. It is Brother Paul's, Brother Paul's didache. He says, he says that scriptures, the intent for scriptures is doctrine. Out of doctrine will come reproof. Out of reproof will come correction that will produce spiritual growth that the man of God may be perfect. Truly furnished unto every good work. Are we teaching this morning? So, very critical. The essence for teaching the scriptures is so that we can arrive at spiritual growth. You are not being taught so you can wow an audience with your exegesis. No, the intent for teaching is spiritual growth. So people can grow. And the proof for spiritual growth is service. When you're growing spiritually, the next thing you want to do is to serve the purpose of God with your growth. To serve the purpose of God. You don't just say, I'm growing spiritually and I'm enjoying Christ. It's not enough. You've got to serve God's purpose with growth. So the proof of growth is service. If you're really growing, we will see you serving. If you're not serving, we doubt your growth. We question your growth. 
Because once people start growing, the hunger in them now is to serve God's purpose with their growth. Because the purpose for growth is to serve. Are we in the building? Yeah, the purpose for growth is to serve. To serve the purpose of God. To serve, the, you know, the, 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 the great commission. Evangelism, raising disciples, turning them into ministers. And that comes by labor. It comes by teaching. Teaching, teaching, teaching. And let me tell you, in evangelism, like I said the other day, you don't just rush the preaching of the gospel. You take your time. Jesus spent three days teaching unbelievers. Not three different conferences in three days. They came for one conference and had no break till the third day. The intensity, teaching unbelievers. Go for evangelism in five minutes, you are finished. Are you ready to receive Christ? He doesn't know what you said. He has not understood anything you have said. Five minutes? No. You can't be smarter than Jesus. You can't be smarter than Jesus. Jesus is the model. He's the one we're learning from. He took three days to preach salvation to unbelievers. Three days. Non-stop. It shows you the intensity with which this God. That's why sometimes we produce false converts. You know who false converts are? False brethren. Because when you now preach the love of God and they are not trying to comp comply and you're in a hurry to go, you say, hellfire is real. The fire will burn. You don't know what will happen to your life after now. You could die. Now you are intimidating and scaring him. So out of fear, he says, okay, I'm ready. I don't want hellfire. What will I say? Say, Jesus, Jesus. The guy is not saved. That's a false convert. But you've given him an impression that he's born again. So he comes to church acting like one who is born again. Meanwhile, inside him, nothing has happened. And we have a lot of them in churches. They are not saved at all. They are far from the truth. I'm teaching good here. Yeah, because it takes time to bring people to a place of conviction. And understanding where the truth of the gospel really gets into their understanding and they are hungry to receive the reality of Christ. I'm talking about doing what will last for eternity. I mean, let's, let's look at a few scriptures. Acts chapter 5 verse 42. Acts chapter 5 verse 42. Look at the way they studied the Bible and raised disciples in the book of Acts. Acts 5, 42. And daily in the temple. How many times? How many times? Now don't tell me these guys were jobless. Don't tell me these guys were jobless. Don't tell. These were Jews. Jews are not jobless. Jews are dogged. Jews are sold out. When they do business, they do it all their lives. Yet they had time to be in the temple daily. Daily in the temple and in every house daily. They cease not to what? To teach and what? Preach who? Jesus Christ. The intensity with which you raise disciples, you can't afford to raise a disciple once in two weeks. By the time you're coming two weeks after, he has forgotten what you said the last time. There's a bombardment that is required because you are dealing with mindsets, you are dealing with strongholds. Strongholds that have been in his mind maybe for 20, 30 years of his life. You can't use 30 minutes to bring it down. There's an intensity, there's a bombardment that his mind requires where the strongholds will disappear before he even knows they disappear by virtue of bombardment. Am I talking to somebody here? That's why people will tell you that, Dr. Damien, I listened to you for many hours. I didn't even know when the change happened. I just found out that I'm changed. Yes, because you expose your mind to a bombardment that pulled down and destroyed things. And by the time you realize yourself, you have left where you are, you are in a new dimension. Am I talking to somebody here? That intensity is what you require for discipleship. That intensity is what you require. Daily in the temple and from house to house. They cease not. They never stopped. They never cease. Every time they met, they fellowship around Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Every time they met. A pastor said to me, Dr. Damina, he said, every time we gather in church, I, I must teach Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I will soon run out of Jesus because you don't have him. You don't have him. That's why you're going to run out. I have him living in me. I can never run out. If I have to teach Jesus every day of my life, I have enough of Jesus to teach. The whole of last day under lockdown, I was teaching almost every day. Sometimes I taught twice a day. 
And there was more than enough. And I never exhausted my lesson notes at any service. And I'm still teaching and I'll continue teaching. There's too much Jesus to teach. Glory to God. You never run out except you don't know what you're talking about. Look at the intensity daily. And these were all business people. These were all career people. These were all professionals. These were all serious business people. Yet they had the time to meet daily in the temple and to meet from house to house. Why? Because they dis discovered that God and his word became a priority. When you see God as priority, you will create time out of your busy schedule. You will always have time for something that you believe is a priority. The reason why you don't have time is because you think God is one of those things in your schedule. Yes. So you're looking for which one to, to put first. You've, you've not yet honored God and put him in his place where he is your lifeline. Where he determines the outcome of your existence. Because once you see him like that, anything that has to do with him will take priority. Am I talking to somebody here? People have excuses because what they are talking about is not really important. When the important things come, all your excuses will be turned to uses. <laughs> they cease not to teach and preach. They cease not. They cease not. Huh. I'm going to show you something. Look at another scripture. Mm. The book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 8. Acts, chapter 19, verse number 8. Acts of the Apostles, 19. And he went into the synagogue. And spake boldly for the space of three months. How many months? Three months. Disputing and past means he was preaching to unbelievers for three months. Steadily, this brother Paul. Disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. For how many months? Three months. Next verse. But when divers were hardened, when the, a number of them were hardened, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them. And separated the disciples. So after three months of preaching in the synagogue, a few believed the gospel. When he discovered the multitudes were complicating things for the few who has believed the gospel, he separated the few and formed a discipleship class. Disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Daily. Look at the next verse. And this continued. By the space of how many years? We don't, the Bible, teach, look, ministry is not joke. Hard labor. Look at two years. So that all they which dwelt in Asia had the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Two years of intensive teaching of God's word. The thing broke. And everybody in Asia got impacted by the gospel. There's an intensity required. In the teaching of God's word. If you are going to raise disciples who will become ministers. There's an intensity. Are you following? Another scripture. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20 verse 31. Acts chapter 20 verse number 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years. Did we see three months? Did we see two years? Now are we seeing three years? Did we see daily? Intensity. <laughs> Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you how many times? Night and day with tears for three years, twice a day. He was teaching twice every day for three years with tears. You want to raise disciples and you walk into people's house, excuse me, give your life to Jesus because Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready now? You are a joker. In fact, you are not serious. There's an intensity. <laughs> this is brother Paul. Let me give you another scripture. Are you ready for this? Acts 28, 23. Acts chapter 28, verse 23. Mm -mm. And when they had appointed him a day, okay, they, they, he, he was looking for a day to spend with them in Bible study. They now accepted and gave him a day. He kept begging them, I need, when can we meet for Bible study? They now gave him an appointment. Come on Saturday. We are free. Wonderful. 
the greatest mistake you can make for a Bible teacher like me is to say, come on Saturday, I am free. You are free? <laughs> I will come to your house 6 a.m. and engage you till 12 midnight because you are free. <laughs> All I'm looking for is the space to be able to, I will pour, you will graduate from Bible school that one day. So now they appointed him a day. There came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. That's how to raise disciples. When is your day off? Tuesday, I'll be your house. What time are you arriving? 7 a.m. You get into his house, you tell him, grab your notes, let's begin. You begin from Moses. You start teaching, you start teaching, you start teaching, you start teaching. After two hours, you pray one hour. You tell him, let's take a break. 30 minutes, we're back again. You use the whole day. Tell him, when next are you off? When next are you off? You said they will not tell you. After that one day, they will be under such supernatural influence. They will tell you next week. <laughs> Say, I'm coming again. 7 a.m. I'll be in your house. Chew on what I have taught you. And on next Tuesday, I'll give you an exam. You ha we'll have a short exam before we start. Be blessed. He's already your student. He's already your student. Turn people into students. Turn people into students. Eternity is what we're talking about. From morning till evening. You remember when Brother Paul did a Bible study? From morning till evening till the next morning. And at midnight, Eutychus fell down and died. Brother Paul raised him back to life, gave him a chair, and continued. <laughs> we're not closing this service. You die, come back here, sit down. Where are you going? Get your notes. We continue. <laughs> oh, I tell you, that's the intensity with which we study the Bible. And that's the intensity with which we raise disciples. Am I teaching good here? It's a serious business. Ministry is serious. And that's what Jesus gave us. That's what Jesus gave us. He gave us his life. He gave us his spirit. Then along with his life and his spirit, he gave us a mandate. And that mandate is what takes all of our time. The Great Commission. To teach, first of all to preach, and then to teach. To evangelize. I'm teaching good this morning. Now, observe that in the Great Commission, Jesus called us to go and raise disciples. And when we say raise disciples, what are the implications? Remember what I taught you? In raising disciples, what do we do? What do we do with raising disciples? Okay, wait. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. In that commission is what? Planting of churches. Within that great commission is church planting. He wouldn't tell you go and preach the gospel, make disciples and say plant churches. Uh -uh. He expects you to decode the code within that commission. That it comes with the responsibility of planting because if I raise disciples, where will I put them? I am not going to raise disciples and put them in a church where I do not attend. I'm not going to expose my disciples to a diet that I cannot feed on. That's not love. I'm not going to raise my disciples and hand them over to a pastor whom I cannot listen to. For what? I'm going to destroy my job. I'm going to destroy my time and my labor. So when I start raising disciples, I jealously protect my disciples. Because the moment you start raising disciples, you're a shepherd. And a shepherd has a rod and a staff. You have a rod and a staff. Once you start overseeing people, there's a rod, an invisible rod and staff in your hand. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He made me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restored my soul. He has a rod and a staff that comfort me. Why am I comforted by the rod and the staff? 
Because I know the staff will direct me, the rod will ward off my enemy. So I'm comforted when I see those two weapons in his hand. So every shepherd has a staff where he helps to give direction to his disciples and a rod that he uses for flogging anyone that will try to interfere with their focus. You flog them out of the way. Flog them out. You don't let them come and steal your sheep and mess them up and waste all your labor and destroy their lives. You're not a good shepherd. So when I start watch, raising disciples, I start watching what they're feeding on. I start watching. Because I'm not going to feed you and let somebody feed you junk that will, that, will, that will cause you to purge out all the things I have put in you. Make my work more, more, more complicated. Where now I have to go back again and start cleaning up instead of building to progress. From morning till evening. From morning till evening, it's called labor. Now, observe Jesus, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Mm -mm. Acts chapter 4, verse number 13. Now, when they saw the boldness, glory to God. When they saw what? The boldness. The boldness. You know, when you start listening to a good Bible teacher, you become bold. Boldness is a function of knowledge. Timidity is a function of ignorance. When you start learning and start learning of Christ and start growing spiritually, you become bold. Because you're not afraid of anything anymore. You know. The reason for fear is ignorance. You don't know. That's why I say God has not given the spirit of fear, but love, power, and what? What, what, makes, what produces a sound mind? Knowledge. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. The, the, the history of Peter and the rest were these guys were illiterate. They were not taught. They were fishermen. They never went to school. They were not intelligent folks. They were just fishermen. But when they saw their boldness and they knew that these guys are ignorant, they marveled. Then they took knowledge of them and concluded these men have been with Jesus. There's no way you will be with Jesus and Jesus will not be speaking through you. They say, oh, these guys must have been with Jesus because even the way they speak is the way Jesus speaks. The, the, the way they, you know, their, their utterance, their confidence, their boldness, they sound exactly like Jesus. They must have been with Jesus. How many of you remember yesterday they were ordained to be with him? They were what? ordained to be with him. And after being with him, that he may send them. So by the time they have been with him, and he now sent them, from their mouths they had Jesus. Because when you spend enough time with Jesus, you drink of him. So what you produce is what you drank from him. They say, oh, these guys must have been with Jesus, because it's evident. We can see Jesus all over them. Even the way they speak, they speak like Jesus. They sound like Jesus. They have been enough with him. They saw their boldness, Peter and John, disciples. When you disciple your disciples well, they become bold. They are not afraid. Because they are built up, they are established, they are rooted, they are grounded. They can take on the devil anywhere, whether you are there or not. And they don't look for counseling from you because they are counseled by the word. Ministry can be so easy if you do it well. I'm able to be with you in America this whole week because at home, all I do is teach. I go to the office of counseling, nobody comes. <laughs> I wait and wait, nobody comes. I get bored and tired, I stand up and go home. Why didn't you guys come for counseling within the week? We don't need it. Why? You already counsel us from the pulpit. All right, so I can travel with my week now, so I can go everywhere I want to go around the world, and my people are covered. They don't even need me. The more you, the more you train people, the, the less they need you. When you see people needing you too much, it's because you're not doing your job. If you really train people well, they wouldn't need you. Why would they need you? What are they looking for? What, all they need you have given to them. So in disciple, we train people to a point where they don't really need us so that they can be released to raise other disciples. I can't be the one looking for counseling. I'm the same person raising disciples. Who counsels who? 
So spiritual growth brings you to a place where you really don't need your mentor too much. You don't really need him too much. You know, all you need him for is to keep teaching. Once he teaches you, you're fine. But some churches, you go in, it's counseling day, the whole church is waiting outside. <laughs> and the pastor is feeling good. You know, I just did counseling Tuesday. We had 300 people lined up for counseling. Glory to God. No, those 300 people say you are a stupid pastor. Very stupid. So since you refuse to do your job on the pulpit, come and do it in the office. You refuse to do your job well on the pulpit, come and do it in the office now. So one by one, we come in. One at a time. And we will walk, walk you out, wear you out, frustrate you, and you can do nothing else but continue counseling us. And when you counsel people in your office, they are not understanding you very well. But when you teach from the pulpit, people are attentive because they know that this is very priceless time. But in the office, you be, they become familiar sometimes. Oh, Pastor, how are you doing? Did you watch soccer the other day? What's your opinion? Did you read the newspapers? You start chatting and the man says, the Lord is speaking to you. He says, no, the Lord can't be speaking now. We're talking football. <laughs> but from the pulpit, we have no chatting opportunity. We teach you the word of God. You drink from me. The best place to really preach to people is from the pulpit. And I'm not talking about pulpit. I'm talking about pulpit. And anywhere can be your pulpit if you are the one in authority speaking over. Because this commission of raising disciples all over the world is on our shoulders and we must execute it. And not just execute it excellently for the glory of Jesus. I didn't have a powerful amen. amen. I'm teaching good this morning. Now, observe, these guys were unlearned and ignorant. But yet they could teach. So that means they must have been taught. So take note of this. Number one. Spending time with Jesus gave them a mandate that had a curriculum and emphasis. Spending time with Jesus gave them a mandate that had a curriculum and emphasis. A didache. It gave them a mandate that had a curriculum and emphasis. The doctrine of the Great Commission is the doctrine of Scripture. The doctrine of the Great Commission is the doctrine of Scripture. That is, the body of beliefs communicated as the Great Commission is Scripture. You don't go and give your testimony. That's not the gospel. Don't tell us how you were a smoker. And as you started hearing the Bible, smoking stopped. That's not the gospel. That's your story. Tell us his story. Don't tell us your story. I've been here for how many hours with you teaching since I came? Have you had any story from me? You've been following my teaching for years now. Have you ever seen me come on that pulpit to tell a story? Do we have time to even teach Bible, talk more of telling a story? How does my story affect you? That story is my story. And I've heard people say, your life experiences becomes your ministry. Fraud! How can your life experiences be your ministry? How are your experiences, how are they, how, how do they affect me? You, 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 if you went through hell and high water in life, that's not your ministry. Come out of it and embrace Jesus and preach Jesus. That's your ministry. Am I teaching here? So don't say I have a ministry for, for people like me. There's no such ministry. Go and preach to all your ministry must be applicable to everybody. And what makes it applicable to everybody is because the message is Christ, who is the desire of all nations. I'm teaching good. So, being with Jesus gave them a curriculum, a body of beliefs to preach. And that body of beliefs is the scripture. Because even when they were with Jesus, how did Jesus, how did he teach them? Beginning at what? Moses and all the prophets. Body of scripture. Somebody say, what's the content of the Great Commission? The body of scripture. That's the content of the Great Commission. Now, number two, he gave them how to teach the scriptures. Jesus, being with Jesus, he gave them the how of teaching the scriptures. There is a how. There is a how of teaching the scriptures. 
That's the second thing. He gave them the how of teaching the scripture. Luke 24, 25. Oh, fool, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And that's the how. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He did what? Expounded, interpreted. He interpreted. So how do we teach the scriptures? We interpret scripture. So what is Bible teaching? Bible teaching is scriptural interpretation. That's Bible teaching. That's Bible teaching. He gave them the how. He taught them how to interpret. He taught them how to interpret. What to look for when studying. Let me give you an illustration of how the disciples who spent time with Jesus, how they interpreted scripture. Let's use one example, Philip. Philip went to Samaria, and I, I hope you know Philip was a deacon. A deacon is one who is, you know, committed to secular, res I mean, physical, physical, res like sweeping, cleaning, arranging table, cooking food, and sharing food. That's what those guys were doing. So Philip now goes to Samaria, okay? And while he's preaching in Samaria, the whole city comes out with joy and receives the gospel. Then the spirit says, now, join the chariot. So he joins the chariot, and he leaves the eunuch in the chariot. All right? So Acts 8, 31. Acts chapter 8, verse number 31. Let's see how the disciples preach the gospel that Jesus taught them when they spent time with him. Acts 8, 31. And he said, how can I? Now, begin from verse 29. 29. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Next verse. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? Do you understand what you are reading? Remember, he is meeting a eunuch and this guy was like the federal minister of finance. This guy is in his chariot. And he's reading. For you to be a federal minister of finance, you must be very educated. And then Philip, who is part of the unlearned and ignorant man, meets an educated man and is asking him, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> you're reading, but do you understand? <laughs> and the man was humble enough to say, look at the next verse. And he said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. So raising disciple is guiding people in the way of the scriptures. Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he will come up and sit with him. Now watch this. You will love this. Next verse. Then the place of the scripture which he read was this. This is where the eunuch was reading before Philip said understand this now. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. Next verse. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Next verse. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. And preach unto him what? Jesus. Philip didn't say, you know what? That place you're reading, leave it. Let's open another side. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. He began from, because if you are conversant with the message of the scriptures, anywhere they open for you in the Bible, you will preach Christ from there. <laughs> he began at the same scripture and preached Jesus unto this man. Why? Because the disciples have learned from Jesus that the whole scripture, whether it is Moses or the prophets or the Psalms, is concerning him. So the first ordination is to be with him. And then he will send them forth. I've had people come to me and say, Dr. Damina, I have a call of God on my life. I want to start a ministry. And I ask them, um, who disciples you? Nobody disciples me, but I, I just love Jesus and I want to spread his word. I say, no, you will cause damage. You are not even ready. You don't even know what you're saying. You need to sit down and calm down. We have a lot of work to do on you first. And sometimes they get offended. And some of them are humble enough to say, okay, uh, I'm ready to be worked on. And then we begin. After a while, they'll be like, 
I didn't know anything. I said, yes, even now, you don't know anything. If you stay longer, you will now know that you didn't know anything even now. Because the truth of the matter is the more you know, the more you discover you don't know. Then the more you want to know. Then the more you discover you really don't know. Then the more you want to know. A pastor in Port Harcourt City came to me. He is a lawyer by profession, but he has a big church and he has a facility he bought. And then as he was pastoring his people, he started following my teachings. Then gradually, he discovered he has nothing to preach. And then he is lazy to study what I teach to teach. So he, he came to his church and said, you know what? There's a man of God I'm following and uh, I have discovered that I am not qualified to teach you guys. So what we shall do as a church, both me and all of you, is we will put the TV screen and follow him. As he keeps teaching, we will all grow together. And the church said, okay. So I got into Port Harcourt and he came to my hotel with his wife. He says, we just want to tell you that we have submitted our ministry to you. You are the one teaching. All of us are students. Me and my members. I said, oh my goodness, that's some good humility. You know, and I recommended other materials for him so that he will have more growth than his people. And he's still doing that for one, two, three years now. And his people love him more. Because he's been honest. And he's not shielding them from the truth. And there are many like that. There are many like that. They all say, Dr. Damina, you know what? It's taken you so many years to come at what you're teaching. I can't use one week to do injustice to what you're teaching. So I'd rather humble myself and patiently learn. And while that is ongoing, my church and myself will learn from you in every service. That's safer. Because if you say, okay, no, Dr. Damina, I'm going to memorize everything. I'm going to copy everything. So I'm going to memorize it and teach it like you teach it. When they throw you a question. <laughs> and even if you make the note, let me tell you something. Even if you make the note of what I'm teaching, and you teach it verbatim, there are statements I make that you don't understand. It's not pride. I'm telling you what I know. There are statements you will, s you will read exactly the way I said it. But even you don't understand. Because there's growth. There's growth. It's a process. Children just don't, don't just stand up, no matter how intelligent they are and go to university. There's a process of growing. There's a process of learning. There are things they learn in the, in the elementary school. When they get into high school, they still learn it and understand better than what they understood when they were in elementary school. When they get to the university, they will still learn the same things, but at another level. Are we communicating? That's the way it is with spiritual things. Why would Jesus spend three and a half years? This is Jesus. Why didn't Jesus just gather the twelve and say, look at me, all of you. <laughs> Go and preach. I have finished. Why didn't you do that? Why did he have to spend three and a half years with them? Teaching, 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 teaching. Then he will send them. Then he will bring them back. He will teach, 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 teach. And even with that, they still didn't understand till he rose from the dead. And then they received the spirit. And then he taught for 40 days. They still didn't understand. Because in Acts chapter 15, they were still arguing that you cannot be saved until you are circumcised. Acts 15, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not even Acts 10. Acts 15. Many years after Pentecost, they still didn't understand salvation. They were still arguing that you must be circumcised. You must stay away from fornication. Don't eat food sacrificed to idols for you to be saved. Even James was the one that was arriving at that conclusion. Then Brother Paul said, I went up by revelation. And I gathered those that were elders among them. And I spent time. And I told them the gods are dead. There are no gods. If you eat food sacrificed to idols, it does not affect you. Paul began to debunk all that nonsense. And even with that, it took years and years and years and years of growth to arrive at the accuracy of do doctrine. Because if you are not careful, you will just be preaching mixture. Yeah, a lot of mixture. Your nuances and all of that. Do you know what Brother Peter said about Paul? I'm talking about Peter. I'm talking about Peter, the rock. 
Peter the rock. <laughs> yeah. The Peter who rebuked Jesus. Jesus said, I will die. He said, stop that. Don't be saying that when I'm standing here. How can you say you will die when men like me are standing here? You think this knife is in vain? <laughs> you think I'm taking this weapon for nothing? I'm your able bodyguard, man. Nobody can touch you while I'm here. Don't be saying it when I'm here. You're insulting my sensibilities. Jesus said, Satan is talking through you. Get behind me. You will deny me three times before the cock crows once. Peter said, you don't understand. And when it was time for action, he acted exactly like he planned. Yeah. The air is gone. He said, who, who is the next? <laughs> Jesus said, calm down. <laughs> calm down, Mr. Man. <laughs> The weapons of our warfare. But mighty through God to the pulling. Up. If I want to fight these people, I will just wink my eye. Mm. A legion of angels will descend and sink this city down. And there will be nobody existing anymore. He said, but this is why I came. This is why I came. And Peter helplessly watched them take Jesus away and he could do nothing about it. They started beating Jesus anyhow. Peter could not help. Now, this same Peter, <laughs> after all of these demonstrations, when he encountered Paul, Peter said, Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Peter said, Wow. First Peter 3 16. Watch, watch what Peter said. First Peter chapter 3, verse 16. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 3 verse 16. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 3 verse number 16. Second Peter, sorry. Second Peter 3 16. Second Peter. Second Peter 3 16. Now Peter began to speak about Paul, brother Paul. Start from verse 15, brother. Second Peter 3 15. But account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now, Peter can speak boldly about salvation because he has been tutored. Let me say this to you. Any preacher that cannot explain salvation is not worth listening to on any subject. Once a preacher cannot explain salvation doctrinally, he is very dangerous to trust on any other matter because salvation is the elementary message of the scriptures. So if you miss it at salvation, you have missed it all. No, I'm serious. So I don't care how powerful a preacher is. I do not listen to him until I hear him on salvation fully. And it's a shame some preachers don't even have a series on salvation. They don't even have a series. Yes, they don't have a series. Part one to three, let's even say part one to five. Five hours of teaching on salvation. Their salvation is altar call. So, wh wh why? Wh what makes you a preacher? I have over 280 hours on salvation. Just salvation. S-A-L-V-A-T-I-O-N. And part nine is coming. And none of them is repeated. <laughs> what makes you a preacher? You gather people that do not know salvation. Then what did you do? The mission of Jesus was to save. So the first thing when you meet Jesus should be salvation. Not salvation by experience, but salvation by understanding. Are we communicating at all? Most questions that believers ask are salvation questions. Most, most are salvation related. So, if you're not sound in the doctrine of soteriology, you can't answer 90% of questions believers have. That is starting point. All these um, crazy things that people are preaching all over the place because they don't understand salvation. Trust me, they don't. They're experts in motivation. You'll make it. You'll get there. You will get there. There's a place called there. You will get there. There where? 
Jesus got there. <laughs> he got there. That's why I won't get there. Because he got there on my behalf. <laughs> Glory to God. <clears throat> so now, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. So Peter now is succumbing and submitting. Even as our beloved, look at the emotions. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Now watch this. Next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Peter admitted that the Pauline theology is hard to be understood even for him. Peter, watch this. Peter was with Jesus, rebuked Jesus, ate with Jesus, traveled with Jesus, slept with Jesus, was there when Jesus went to the cross, was there when Jesus rose from the dead. Peter never saw Jesus once, never met Jesus once. I mean, Paul. Paul never met Jesus once, never saw Jesus once, never sat under Jesus, never listened to Jesus on anything. Yet it took Paul to teach Peter, who was with Jesus, Jesus. It took Paul, who never saw Jesus, never sat under Jesus, never listened to Jesus, never had an encounter with Jesus physically, to teach Peter, who was always with Jesus, Jesus. You know why? Because revelation is higher than education. Revelation knowledge. That's why it's not how long you've been in church. It's how much revelation of God's word are you exposed to. It's not age. Ministry is not age. Most times the people that you disciple are older than you. Most times they are older than you. So don't look at their age. Because if you look at their age, you send them to hell. <laughs> Ignore their age. Look at their spiritual age. That will give you more confidence. That some of them are biologically 50, but spiritually five days. So when you know this is a five-day-old baby, you will be confident to have stopped that. Sit down, right. <laughs> Am I complicating at all? That's how to look at it, because that's the way it is. In which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, they wrestle with Paul's teaching. As they do also the other scriptures. So brother Peter, brother Peter accepted that the Pauline theology is in the same weight with the canon of scripture. Now for Peter to acknowledge that is major. Major. Peter said, look, brother Paul's epistles is the same with other scriptures. So the same way they stumble at other scriptures is the same way they stumble at the Pauline theology. And they say they wrestle with this to their own destruction. So Peter acknowledged that Paul was no mean person. And Peter was humble enough to acknowledge that. You know? Okay, how many books did Peter write? Eh? When you don't know much, you don't talk too much. Peter just wrote first and second Peter and recommended brother Paul at the end of his writing. And said, I rest my case. <laughs> Are we together here? That's why Paul said, I was born out of Jews' time. He says, I was, I'm the least of all of them, but I labored more than all of them. Yet not I, but grace at work. Yeah, grace at work. I am what I am by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Say with me, I will raise disciples. I will labor and raise disciples and turn them into ministers for the glory of God. I didn't have a good amen. I'm doing a good job today, right? Now, so take note, he taught them how to interpret scriptures because that is the way you raise disciples. You interpret scriptures to them. 
Do you know that many people you will meet and in the course of evangelism have too many questions they are looking for answers for? Many people you meet. So that is why Bible teaching is answering questions. Bible teaching is answering questions. What Bible teaching does is to answer people's questions. Because in interpreting scripture, as people are understanding, their questions are getting answered. And as their questions are getting answered, their confidence and assurance in God grows. Their confidence grows. Their confidence grows. Are we together? He also taught them in Luke 24, 45. The Bible says their understanding, their thinking was opened. So he taught them how to interpret scriptures. He taught them how to interpret scriptures with scriptures. You interpret scriptures with scriptures. Are you following? Let me give you an illustration. How many of you have read that scripture in Matthew? Where say, As it was, it says two people shall be in the house. One shall be taken, one shall be left. Eh? One shall be taken, one shall be left. As it was in the days of what? No, so shall be in the days of the Son of Man. Two shall be, one shall be taken, one shall be left. So people preach that as the end of times. But that's not what he was talking about. He was talking about the end of time. One taken, one left. What happened in the days of Noah? The people that were taken were the people that the flood destroyed. The people that were left were the people in the ark. You didn't see it. Let me repeat. How was it in the days of Noah? The people in the ark were the ones that were left. The people outside the ark were the ones that were taken. Let me say it again. Some of you are trying to still see it. <laughs> two, shall be take, two shall be in the bed. One shall be taken. One shall be left. Two shall be grinding in the meal. One shall be taken. One shall be left. As it was in the days of Noah. So shall be in the days of son of man. So question. In the days of Noah, which is the analogy through which Jesus is bringing the spiritual truth. What happened? The people that entered the ark were the people that didn't die with the flood. So that means they were the ones that were left. The people that didn't enter the ark were the people that the flood destroyed. So that means they were the ones that were taken. So that scripture is not rapture. Because the people taken were the people that didn't enter the ark. The people left behind were the people that were in the ark. <laughs> Are you still following? Are you still following? <laughs> are you following? Are you following? Are you following? It's not a rapture scripture. Are you following? It was a scripture Jesus was using to explain. That those who believe in him will be eternally saved. And those who don't believe in him will perish. That's what he was saying. So that parable was him revealing himself to them. It has nothing to do with the end of time. But you see, it takes Bible teaching and interpretation to open those kind of scriptures. Because then the question will be, husband and wife, who will be taken, who will be left? <laughs> See, but it's an analogy. Jesus was using to just show that when you believe in him, you will be left behind. But those who don't believe in him will be taken. So when they didn't understand that, they now did a movie in Hollywood, left behind. And you watched it and cried. <laughs> and when they do those movies, they're very wicked. It is the pastor that is always left behind. They don't like us. <laughs> the pastor is left behind with the choir. 
and the members clothes you see women's cats women clothes dropping men's clothes dropping and the pastor is pastoring clothes left behind so now preachers will tell you you will be left behind one will be taken one will be left for what I want to be left. I want to be left. You, pastor, be taking me. <laughs> Glory. That's what Bible interpretation does. Bible interpretation brings life out of scriptures. And when people see that life, that is what brings transformation. So in raising disciples, what are we disciples, what are we doing? Bible interpretation. See that? Now, <coughs> excuse me. Didache, mode of teaching, is critical. So Jesus said, beware of the mode of teaching of the Pharisees. So there's a wrong way to teach scriptures, and there's a right way to teach scriptures. So that somebody is teaching scriptures is not enough. We must be able to know which is the right way and which is the wrong way. There's a proper way of interpreting scriptures and there is an improper way of interpreting scriptures. And that is what we've been going you know, all over the scriptures in the last few days. What is evangelism? <clears throat> Let's get into some rudiments. What is evangelism? Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. He said unto them, who? Mark 16, 14. And afterward, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at table and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So who did he tell to go and preach? The eleven. So there was a clear cut instruction to preach to every creature. Every creature means every person. Evangelism, therefore, is the act of preaching the gospel to the unsaved man. Evangelism is the act of preaching the gospel to the unsaved man. That's evangelism. What is the gospel? The word gospel is the word you are jelia. You are Jelia or you are Jelion or in the Hebrew, Basar. The gospel. The gospel. Okay. So what is the gospel? The gospel means good news. Good news. Good news. Good news. Not condemnation. Not threat. Not intimidation. Good news. Good news. When the gospel comes, people should be happy because good news gladdens the heart. You shouldn't be hearing gospel and be crying and be full of fear. You should hear gospel and scream glory. And you know some people believe that you're not preaching until people are crying. Because they are bringing intimidation. That's the law of Moses. The gospel is good news. Say with me, I'm a carrier of good news. Say I dispense the good news of his resurrection. Can I have a good amen? Now so the good news is a good, not just good news. The gospel is not just good news. It's a kerugma. Kerugma taken from keru, keruso. Kerugma is spelled as K-E-R-U-G-M-A. Kerugma. Kerugma means specific information. The gospel is not just good news. The gospel is specific information. Specific information about the death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. Financial breakthrough is good news, but it's not the gospel. Marital breakthrough is good news, but it's not the gospel. Okay? The gospel is specific. Kerugma. Taken from the word keruso. To proclaim a specific information. Now, how do, we, how do we define the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, in fact from verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 1. Moreover, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you have received, and in which you stand. 
wherein you stand. Listen, when you really preach the true gospel, people stand. The real gospel of Christ makes people stand. I'm not talking about smoothies. Uh, I'm talking about pure gospel. Because a lot of people, what they preach is smoothies. Moses, Elijah, Jesus, smoothies. They blend it together and give it to enjoy. No, we don't serve no smoothies here. We give you pure word. Am I teaching good? He said, the gospel wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Brother Paul, leave all that. What is the gospel? Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which, also, which I also received. This same thing is what saved me. It is what I gave to you. How that Christ died for our sins. How? According to the scriptures. Not according to my experience, but according to the scripture. So if I'm going to talk about the death of Christ, I have to pull it out of the canon of scripture to show you that that death was not, was not accidental, that that death was not martyrdom, but that death was the death of a criminal. He died the death of a criminal. He didn't die the death of a good guy. He was not a good guy in death. He was a criminal. That's why he was crucified between robbers. Why? Because the death was not his death. The death was my death. I sinned. I should have died. But he came in my place as a substitutionary sacrifice. He died my death so I can have his life. He went to hell. I go to heaven. He was rejected. I am accepted. He died. I live. Can somebody shout glory? Glory. It is called substitutionary sacrifice. He was condemned. I'm righteous. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Which scriptures? Surely he was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes I am healed. Brother Paul quoted that scripture and gave it a different explanation in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Wherefore God made him sin for us who knew no sin. That we who knew sin might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody shout glory. Oh yes, he died my death, I live his life. He died, with, he died without apology, I live without apology. He brutally died. I brutally live. Somebody shout, I hear you. He radically died. I radically live. Oh, glory to God. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more. Now, now, now sit, sit, sit. Don't get me too happy. Sit, sit. <laughs> glory that john chapter 10 verse 10 actually in in proper translation it's not that you may have life more abundantly mm -mm. life life is not in measures <laughs> life is not in measures i can't say a baby has been born but he has 30 percent life doctor can you increase it to 50 percent no once a baby is born the baby has life. So once you receive Jesus, you have life. So there's nothing like abundant life. Mm -mm. So the original is, I am come that you may have life and be abundant. That is when you have my life, you will be abundant. That's the original. So it's not to have life more. Uh, mm -mm. That's, 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 uh, there's a translation issue there. The original is that you may have life. And by that life, you will now have abundance. Is it clear? How that Christ died for our sin. That's the gospel. According to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again. The third day, according to the scriptures. So even the Pauline theology was not experience-based. It was scripture based. 
You don't preach your experience in evangelism. You preach Christ. Don't tell stories. Let their faith not rest on the wisdom of your stories, but in the power of God, which is the message of his cross. The preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto us that are saved is the power of God. We preach his cross, and the cross is a symbol for death, burial, and resurrection. Are we teaching? So, the gospel has specific facts in the scriptures. It has is specific sensitive. The gospel is specific sensitive. Death, burial, resurrection. The facts are his death, burial, resurrection. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The word to give that he gave means died. To give means to die. That's Bible language. That he gave his only, meaning God loved the world, that he he gave up his son to die. That means the love of God for man is proven in the death of Christ. So the death of Christ is the proof for the love that God has for man. Are we in the building? Yes. That's the proof. Now, also observe Romans chapter 4 verse 25. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4 verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Delivered, given up. Okay? Romans 16 25. Romans 16 25. Now to him that is able to establish you according to my gospel. What is brother Paul's gospel? That is the preaching of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the preaching of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? The so if you're not preaching Jesus Christ, are you preaching the gospel? Yes. Now, hold this. The preaching of Jesus Christ. And somebody said, but we are all preaching Jesus Christ. Dr. Damina, we've been preaching Jesus Christ before you were born. Yeah, we're all preachers of Jesus Christ. Yeah, you are preaching Jesus Christ, but it doesn't end at preaching of Jesus Christ according to the apocalypse. It's not just pre-Jesus. It has to be according to the revelation of the mysterion, the apocalypse of the mysterion, the revelation of the hidden secret, the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So there is a hidden secret in the Old Testament that has to be uncovered as the gospel. So it's not enough to preach Jesus, but it has to be Jesus according to the unveiling of the mystery hid since the world began. You understand? Is they see in the sea, but they see not. Hearing they hear, but they hear not. Because it's concealed. He said, Are the princes of this world known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. What didn't they know? They didn't know that the crucifixion of Jesus was the salvation of mankind. Because it was a mystery. You know, the way God operated was he hid all the things that pertain to us in a mystery and gave to the prophets to prophesy. So the prophets of the Old Testament were busy prophesying the realities of the new creation. But they themselves didn't know what they were saying because it was concealed. You know, so somebody like Jonah will fall into the sea and the fish will swallow him. Three days and vomit him. And he thinks it's a coincidence. But that was the gospel preached. Are you following? A man like David will fall in a cave. And he will try to come out of the cave. He can't come out. He looks for help. Nobody is available to help. He looks So because of frustration, out of that frustration, he is forced to bring a prophecy. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's exactly what Jesus will say on the cross. But there's no way David will say it if he never fell in a cave where nobody was there to help him. 
So in types, shadows, in the experiences and encounters, they kept speaking concerning the New Testament without knowing what they were saying. Hallelujah. That's why the Old Testament is mystery. Are you following? Look at the way Brother Peter will say it in the book of First Peter, chapter 1, verse 10. First Peter, chapter 1, verse number 10. Mm -mm. Of which salvation the prophets, talking about the Old Testament prophets now, the prophets have, have inquired. So look at me, everybody. When you read the Old Testament, what you will see is a bunch of inquiries. You will see inquiries. Because the Old Testament prophets didn't really know. They were just used to speak. But when they spoke, they inquired. And searched. So you will see their search in their writings. You will see their inquiries in their writings. Those are not conclusions. So that's why it must be interpreted. They searched. They inquired. Who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you? Watch the next verse. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Next verse. Unto whom it was revealed and not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you which the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. So the prophets didn't know what they were saying and the angels didn't know what they were saying. And when they said, God, what are we saying? God said, shut up, it's not for you. The people it is meant for, when their time comes, they will understand. Are you following? So the Old Testament patriarchs didn't know what, what we know. That's why today is not the day of Elijah. <laughs> These are the days of Elijah. Shut up. <laughs> Go and read your Bible. Go and read your Bible. Don't let ignorance undress you in public. Go and read your Bible. These are not the days of Elijah. These are the days of the sons of God. Elijah was a servant with all due respect. I'm not a servant of God. I'm a son of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. As many as receive him to them gave thee power to become the sons of God of God. Amen. These are not the days of Elijah. These are not the days of David. Those are all servants. Those are all servants. This is the day of the new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God. All things are of God. Everything in me is of God. No generational curse. No family curse. I'm a brand new man. I don't have a history. I only have a future. Glory to God. My history is Christ. My future is Christ. In him I live and move. And have my being. Somebody shout glory. glory. Are you getting blessed? So that's the gospel we preach. That's what we spend hours in people's houses teaching. And that's how we raise them into students. It has a definite specific curriculum. Discipleship. Even the preaching of the gospel has a specific curriculum. You don't just speak anyhow. There's a message that must be preached to a sinner. And when he's saved, there's another message that must be preached to a believer. So we have two books that we wrote to help our church people with. The one, the first one for evangelism is called Evangelism Ready. Are you ready? That book, you can take it for evangelism and just stand and read it. Yes. And it's powerful. Just read it. Don't even add, just read it. It will save a sinner. What about the Bible? Is it not reading? We are reading. And it is saving us. And then we did another book. When you are now saved. But this new book is not on sale. It's a manual. That you now use for discipleship. So that you, are, you have no excuse to say. I don't know what to say. We have given you everything to say. Because even Jesus when he sent it to us. He said when you go say. 
He gave them what to say. When you go, say the kingdom of God. He told them what to say. So we took from what the doctrine of scripture says to say and we put it together for you as a lesson outline in raising somebody from scratch to where he is ready to raise another disciple. Are you following? Yeah. And they're all intensive materials. Now, 1 Timothy 1.11 calls it glorious gospel. Glorious according to the glorious gospel. Brother Paul, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And then brother, you know, brother Matthew says, go into all nations and teach all nations. All nations. Jews and non-Jews. Nations. So the instruction clearly was to go out and preach. Listen, in evangelism, you don't sit in your house and invite people to come. You go to their house. And even in raising disciples, you go to them. You don't ask them to come to you. No, you go to them. When God wants to save us, he came to us. So if you want to raise disciples, you must be ready to make the sacrifice of going to them. Sit in their space and raise them as disciples. And listen quickly. Your target for discipleship is not to bring them to our church. That's not your target. Your target is to raise them as disciples first. When they have understood what you are teaching, they will be the one that will say, where is the church? <laughs> so don't put your church in the front of the book. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis is Christ. Somebody say, I hear you. When, when they now understand Christ, they will be the one looking for church. So when you go and they say, which church are you coming from? Say, it doesn't matter. This is not about church. It's about your life. We came here to fix your life. <laughs> Get your pen and paper. Let's begin. Your life is out of sorts. I'm sure you're not sure where you will spend eternity. Life is temporal. Eternity is eternal. We want to fix that for you. Glory to God. Get your pen and paper. Let's do this thing. No apologies. <laughs> Are you with me here? Yes. Your friends in your place of work, your neighbors... People you meet on the road. And that's why I say, child of God, you must befriend people. Yeah. Don't be stuck up in your religion. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. You are greeting people in tongues. <laughs> you have a problem. Go around making friends because you have a plan to disciple them. When you go for groceries, make friends. Hi, good morning. How are you? Can I help you with your cart? Oh, okay. How are you? Good morning. Help them. Oh, you want to buy? How much is it? Okay, I can add a hundred dollar to you. Just, you, can I have your card? I want us to be friends. Make friends all over the place because it is through the line of friendship you can disciple people. So I say, you know, I live in a country where you can't just knock at people's doors. Make friends when you go out. You can't knock at their doors. When you become their friends, you will not only knock at their doors, you will knock their doors open. <laughs> Am I teaching good? Yeah. You build relationships. Somebody shout relationships. Yeah. That's the way to evangelize in the Western world. You make, rela you make friends all over the place. And don't be selective in who you make your friend. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. All. Make them your friends. Grab their numbers. Send them text messages. Be blessed. I'm praying for you. Be blessed. I'm praying for you. When you need somebody to pray, don't forget to call me. I live my life praying. Send people messages. Tell them, I'm going to pray until it works for you. That's how to begin. And then they will trust you. They will open up to you. Then you invade their space with the gospel. When they are taking over, they will not know. They will only discover they've been taken over. Say, I hear you. But when you are so selfish and stuck up in your own ways, you don't care about anybody else. It's only me, me, my, 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 my. You cannot be a preacher of the gospel. Sometimes just deliberately drive to the mall and look for how to make friends. Today I'm out to make friends. Glory to God. Smile until your cheeks are paining you. <laughs> your dress is nice. Your tie is born again. Your earrings are anointed. Go around just. <laughs> Am I teaching good? 
That's how you make friends, and that's how you get across. Before you know it, you have 20 friends on your list and 15 are already disciples. Then you increase again. And we've said it to all our campuses and those of you that are going to be starting new campuses and all that. Create a Facebook page quickly for your community and begin to put my messages in there. And as people comment, you respond to their comments and build relationships. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Before you know it, you have a WhatsApp group with 15, 20 people that you are discipling in online. Church has started. Amen. Some of us, is just plain laziness. There's so much work to be done, and we have all it takes to do the job. It's just that we are not interested, or we, we, we are too self-centered. Yes. Just me, 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 me. Father, you have not answered my prayer. I've been waiting for a breakthrough. The breakthrough has not come. Oh, Jesus, are you still on the throne? Have you been overthrown? I don't know why. I, 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 you answered the answer, uh, prayer of sister so and brother so my own. You have not answered. Oh, delay is not denial. It's what you keep telling me. Delay is not denial. But Lord, I am being denied. You're complaining, my friend. You cannot do the ministry like that. You must forget yourself and put Christ in the forefront. And when you get busy with people's lives, you will discover your problems are solved without you praying. Let me be honest with you. My wife and I, and she's here. We don't have any prayer point. You know why we don't have prayer point? We're busy taking care of people's needs, so God is taking care of ours. Sometimes we just talk about it and wish it. And just go away doing what we're doing, and then it's taken care of. Sometimes while we're still talking about it, it's taken care of. We don't have to pray about it. Your heavenly father knows you, know, you need this things. He knows you need this. He's not a tyrant that you have to be begging, Father, Father. It is written, Father, Father. Yeah. What kind of father is that? He's a responsible, responsible family man. He said anybody that does not take care of his own is worse than an infidel. If God doesn't take care of you, he also is worse than an infidel. We learn fathering from him. And he's a responsible father. Are you understanding? So get busy with his kingdom. Get busy with his work. Get busy with his purpose. And all other things will be taken care of. But when you are self-centered, you are not in his will. And when you are not in his will, you are in your will. So you must take care of yourself. But when you are in his will, he has made provisions to take care of everything you need. Glory to God. Lift your right hand and shout, God supplies my needs. According to his riches in glory, by Christ Jesus. I have no need, I have supplies in Christ Jesus. Amen. So it's called the glorious gospel. The gospel is good news. All nations. Some say, I don't know how to, well, I've told you how to do it. I've told you how to make friends. I've told you how to preach. I've told you how to get people that are ready to be discipled. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. You can decide, okay, the next place we want to start a campus, I want to start a campus there. Even though I don't live there, I'm going to start a campus there. Where? I'm going to start a campus in Washington State. So what do I do? Create a Facebook page. Talk to us. Connect with us. Create a Facebook page. Washington State Power City. Then you start posting videos in Washington State Facebook. You sponsor it to Washington State. And it will be on everybody's face in Washington State. And people will start following in Washington State. Before you know it, you have a campus in Washington State without being in Washington State. Your disciple is raised and discipled and he starts pastoring me. You've got to excuse. Turn your excuses to uses. I don't know where it came from. It's Pastor Emmanuel that gave it to me. <laughs> Glory! <laughs> now, watch this. So, he says you should go and preach the gospel to every nation. How many nations? Every nation. God told Abraham, in thee shall all nations be what? Be blessed. What is the blessing? The forgiveness of sins. The, the blessing is the forgiveness of sins. Righteousness devoid of works. That's the blessing. 
It's not cars and houses. Is that your sins are forgiven irrespective of you and, in, you know, without your contribution. That's the blessing there. Blessed is the man to whom you will not impute iniquity. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. That's the blessing. Righteousness by faith. Glory to God. I say glory to God. So, God desires that all men should be saved. John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why is he condemned already? Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the gospel is preached so that men can believe and be saved. What is the good news? The good news is the message of what Christ has done, not what Christ will do. What Christ has, has, has done. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any soul should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. So God desires that all men be saved. Therefore, the gospel deals with the eternity of people. Even though it has a bearing on now, but the full picture is from now till eternity. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Now, let me deal with something quickly before we go on a break. I hope you remember I told you the message is the forgiveness of sins. Righteousness without works. Okay? The message does not contain condemnation. Huh? It does not contain what? Uh -uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. Somebody was asking me, Dr. Damina, what's your take on homosexuals and all the bisexuals and all the different sexuals? I say, God loves all of them. Say, so should they come to church? Yes, where else should they go? Church is where they should come. Because they are not normal. They are having crisis in their mind. And only the gospel can rewind the mind. It's just identity crisis. They don't know who they are. And when a man doesn't know who he is, he can become a dog, he can become a cow, he can become anything. So the gospel will fix you by revealing you to you. Once you know who you are, you will put off the wrong identity and put on the right identity. Am I talking to somebody here? So we love them. We love them homos. We love them lesbians. We love all of them. Oh yes, we love them and we are not playing. We genuinely love them. And we feel for their condition and we want to be of help. We have people back in Nigeria who are homosexuals and lesbians who just by following my ministry have gotten out of all that and they have realized who truly they are. And they are free from it. People that were bound by pornography, totally liberated and set free by the gospel they hear. Nobody condemning them. Just bringing their realities to them. Bringing their realities to them. Once their realities dawn on them, they will recover their senses. The prodigal son said, what am I doing here? What am I? But before that, he thought he was doing the right thing. But when his senses came back, he said, what am I doing? I'm eating with pigs. I will arise. In my father's house, even servants have enough to eat. I will go back home. And I will say to my father, make me a servant. But you know what? He came and the father says, my son that is lost is back. But he had to come back to his senses. So what the gospel does is to bring you back to your senses. Are we teaching good? Yeah. And we don't stigmatize people. Yeah. No, we love all of them. Yeah. We love all of them. We have no problem with them. The gospel accepts everybody the way they are. Yeah. Don't change before you come. Come the way you are. Right. Don't try to change because you'll be a hypocrite. Yeah. Come the way you are. The gospel will bring the power that will change you. Yeah. Is the power of God unto what? salvation. I'm preaching good. Now, <clears throat> where can one preach? In the market. In America, we call it the malls. In Africa, we call it market. At work. In the salon. Yeah, that salon. Sisters. 
Six hours making your hair. Discipleship. <laughs> They're making your hair, holding the manual. John chapter 1, verse 12. I hope you're listening. As many as receive it, even your hair will be made with anointing. <laughs> in the bus. Yeah, in the bus. In the bus. While you're driving to a distance, you just sit by somebody and make the person your friend and begin to preach. I got in the aircraft, I was coming to America, and I sat with a guy. As soon as I walked into the, you know, to, to my seat, he was sitting by the window, and I was to sit on the aisle. So I was trying to put my, my, my suitcase up there in the compartment, and the guy, something fell from my pocket. He picked it up for me, and I thanked him. And he looked at me, and he said, you're a pastor. <laughs> I said, how do you know? He said, I know pastors. I said, what about you? He said, I'm a Muslim. He said, but I love Jesus. I said, trouble, this flight. <laughs> this flight, this man will speak in tongues in this blade. <laughs> what I am looking for, you're supplying me. Hi. Quickly, I put the box and sat by him. We started this course. We discussed throughout the flight. We exchanged numbers. We got back to Nigeria. He told me, the next time you're coming to Lagos to preach, I'm going to be your protocol. I'll hold your Bible. He said, I will come to your city and listen to you preach. Oh yeah. That whole flight was evangelist. What are you waiting for? Yeah. You sit by people who don't know Jesus and you sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and wake up and say goodbye. <laughs> Is that why you got on that plane? You got on that plane because you're going to sit by somebody that will need Christ. Amen. Preach the word in and out of Amen. every opportunity you have. Shine the light. So, in the aircraft, on the streets, in your community, over the phone, on social media, create a WhatsApp group and start bringing people in there and start discipling in them. When the gospel is preached, what should be the response? Dead, burial, resurrection of Jesus and his lordship must be acknowledged. The people must acknowledge that Jesus died for them, he was buried for them, he rose again for them. That is what brings the reality of Christ in the heart of a man. What are the excuses that people give all the time when we go for evangelism? Location, time, I'm busy, I'm not bold. My job. People just bring all kinds of excuses. You must be ready for the excuses. So as they are bringing it, you're shooting it down. Don't let any excuse stop people from being discipled and stop people from, you know, uh, obeying the Great Commission under your watch. Acts 8.4. Therefore, they that were dispersed went everywhere preaching the word. They went where? Everywhere. everywhere. This explains why Paul, I mean Philip, was able to take the initiative to go to Samaria because they went everywhere. Now, so what's the role of evangelism? Please take this down. This is very important. What's the role of evangelism or, or prayer in evangelism? Sorry. What's the role of prayer in evangelism? Remember, prayer doesn't save anyone. It is preaching of the gospel that saves. That means after praying for people to be saved, you must go and preach. Now, you know, uh, 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 I, I am an intercessor. First of all, nobody is an intercessor. All those intercessory departments in churches are misplaced priorities. Nobody is an intercessor. Jesus is the only intercessor. So what should we have in churches? We shouldn't have any intercessory group. Everybody should be praying. We all supplicate. All of us supplicate. We don't intercede. Jesus has interceded on our behalf. And is our intercessor. While we supplicate. We pray prayers of supplication. And it's not to a group. Everybody prays. In Power City, you all know, everybody prays. We don't have special people who pray. Because we all wrestle not against flesh and blood. We all pray with all prayer and supplication with perseverance for all sins. We all pray. There's nothing like prayer ministry. It does not exist in the Bible. 
Say, I have a prayer. Shut up. You don't know the Bible. Don't let ignorance disgrace you. There's nothing like a prayer ministry. All of us are called to the ministry of prayer. There's no special prayer ministry. Peter and John went to the temple at the hour of prayer. Because all of them were praying. Teaching good? No prayer ministry. And there's no deliverance ministry. It does not exist even in the Old Testament. It does not exist even in the Old Testament. Talk more of the New Testament. <laughs> There's no such thing. All those are additions because people don't know what they ought to know. Prayer doesn't save anyone. It is the preaching of the gospel that saves. So when we pray, we pray for the preacher and the message. And if you are the preacher, you pray for yourself. We pray that the message is not hindered. We pray for boldness and preservation and wisdom, also for signs and wonders. We pray for wisdom. We pray for boldness. We pray for preservation. We pray that the message is not hindered. And then we pray for signs and wonders as the gospel is preached. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 19. You will see the prayer there. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 to 3. Ephesians 6, 19. Second Thessalonians 3, 1 to 2. Colossians 4, 3 to 3, 2 to 3. Acts chapter 4, verse 29. 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 Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 to 3. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 to 3. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 to 3. Acts 4, 30. Acts 4, 30. Acts 4, 30. Romans Chapter 16, verse 19. Romans 16, 19. I'll go over the list again. Ephesians 6, 19. Second Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. Colossians 4, 2 to 3. Acts 4, 29. Acts 4, 30. Romans 16, 19. All right. Let me introduce discipleship. Then we go on a break. The second leg of evangelism is discipleship. That's the Great Commission. The Great Commission is evangelism and discipleship. It involves the aftermath of the sinner being saved. Discipleship involves the aftermath of the sinner being saved. Having sorted out the first, which is salvation, we ought to find out what to do with this man that has just received Jesus. And Jesus commands us to teach. Teach. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Teach. Teach. The word go, go into all the world used by Mark 16 is the Greek word poromai. I will spell P-O-R-E U-O-M-A-I poromai. It actually implies to transverse, to travel, go, to transverse, to travel, is an active instruction that we must go, travel. If you have to travel to a country to go and start a campus, go there for that purpose. When you have established them, you come back. It's called mission work. Sometimes we have to team up and go for missions. Take a whole week, go to a city, stay there for a week, raise disciples, disciple them, Set them up, come back, continue with them online. The kingdom is that serious. Sometimes we have to look for a country where the gospel is not well preached. We invade the place, take one whole month off, go there and raise disciples. Go means travel. It means transverse everywhere around the world. Come everywhere open and take the gospel in there. That's how serious. Remember, God became a man to die for this gospel. So this gospel is more serious than anything else. Now, the primary word used for teaching is the word didasko. Didasko. The Greek word didasko. I gave you didache. <laughs> I gave you didaskalos. Didaskalia. Okay? Now I'm giving you didasko. Didasko. D-I-D-A-S-K-O. Didasko. That's a primary word used for teaching in the New Testament Greek. 
First Timothy chapter 4 verse 11. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 11. Didasco. And First Timothy chapter 6 verse 2. Didasco. These things command and teach. First Timothy 6 2. 6 verse 2. So, the word didasco, he says, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things, teach, teach, and exhort. Didasco. It means to teach, all right? The converse of to learn. Teach. But in Matthew 28, 19, he uses the Greek word matatheo. It means to disciple. This means to make a student out of a person. So we will note that the word disciple was used throughout the book of Acts. Disciples, disciples. How many of you observed that in the book of Acts it was about disciple, disciple, the disciples believed, the disciples went together, the disciples, because discipleship, it's, it's one of the ways we build believers in the body. In fact, the primary way. The primary way. We disciple people. And discipleship involves teaching. Teaching what the body of truth. What's the body of truth? The scriptures. Now, you know you cannot make a sinner a disciple, right? You know that, right? He has to be saved before you disciple him. So, if he's a sinner, what are you doing? Evangelism. Then when he's saved, what do you do? Discipleship. Correct. Very correct. Now, and you, you know the work is so easy for us in Power City because all my teachings are available out there. And you can get your disciple to listen to my teachings twice a day. And it can make your work easy. He listens to my teachings twice a day. When you meet with him, you need to answer questions and to inspect his notes. Let me see your notes for the week. You've been following Dr. Damina's teaching. Let me see the things you scribbled. Okay, okay. What questions do you have? You answer. And then you explain a few things. That's a lot of discipleship going on. I have saved you so many hours just by exposing them to follow my teachings and you supervising. How many of you understand what I just said? Mm. So I've made the work so easy for you. Very easy. And that, that means we can have speed in the things we do. We can have a lot of speed. And because you're already conversant with my teachings, you will know what series to recommend for a new believer to follow. You understand? You won't recommend the law and the prophets for a born-again person who just repented today. He doesn't need law and prophets. <laughs> he needs Soteria season one. You know? Soteria season one. ABCs of salvation. That should take care of the person. You know? Or in Christ's realities. Season one, part one. Okay. So, you know, materials are available. So, it's easy for us to raise disciples. So, which means, therefore, that the epistles, which is the body of truth in the New Testament, are our primary materials for raising disciples. The epistles. Because they were letters written to different churches. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 7. Romans chapter 1 verse 7. Glory. Glory. Are you tired or you're still here? Romans 1, 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God. They were letters written to churches. The epistles were letters written to believers. So those are letters that you can read and teach new converts to experience the reality of Christ. Hallelujah. So what is follow up? Follow up is discipleship. Follow up is discipleship. It's not checking people or making frantic phone calls for the fellow to attend church. <laughs> excuse, excuse, I didn't see you in the last service. Where were you? Mm -mm. That's, not, that's not follow up. That's harassment. <laughs> because the purpose is not for them to come to church. The purpose is for them to know Christ. When they know Christ, they will naturally come to church. I don't make coming to church the main thing because they will soon start resisting you. Because you are, that means you are not really interested in them. All you want is a number added to your church. Nobody wants to just be a number. So they must know that your interest is basically in them knowing Christ. 
you know, and as they get to know Christ, the hunger in them will, will, will naturally develop. And they will be the ones saying, but when are we meeting to fellowship? And we teach that back home too. We tell our people in church, don't make bringing them to our church a priority. We're not looking forward to fill up our building. No, it's already filled. And filled more than once. So don't be looking for how to increase them. Raise them. Raise them, raise them, raise them. We've even started starting, we've started starting extension churches within our city. Just take a number of people of you, go. Don't come here again. Go there. Start a church there. Grow them. One, two, three, four, five. You go. Go to that side of that. Go and start. Don't come. I don't want to. If I see you. <laughs> yes, because. <laughs> because that is what it is about. It's not building an empire. We're not looking forward to build an empire. We're looking forward to raise men. Glory. Glory. I'm teaching good. Yes. We're raising men. So follow up is not frantic calls. It is to make the fellow a student of the word. In Acts 2 31, I mean Acts 2 41, 3,000 souls were saved. Then 42 says they continued steadfastly. This means a system was created for them. A system of learning. This is discipleship. Steadfastly implies daily. Implies what? So that's why if you follow me on Facebook and YouTube, I am on twice every day. Because that is how disciples are raised. Consistency. So every day, two hours of your time, sometimes three hours. Because sometimes my teachings are one hour, 30 minutes or 25 minutes. Okay? So three hours of your time every day is given to learning. And the teachings are organized. We don't just throw teachings anyhow. If we start a series, we keep you on it to its logical conclusion. Then we start another one. Different series in the morning, different series in the evening. Is that true? And then, of course, we have them stored up on YouTube. So even, even if the videos are missing on Facebook, you can go to our, our YouTube page and check it out there and continue your notes. So you're not lacking. You have every material. You have no excuse. Glory to God. Acts 19.10, he separated the disciples. And I told you that this morning. So how do we disciple people? We disciple men with the word, the gospel, what Christ has done. In discipleship, what do you do? You create a discipline. The word disciple is the same word for discipline. They are from the same root word. Disciple means you have given the person a discipline. Where he prays every day. He studies the Bible every day, and he evangelizes every day. That's a discipline. And after a while, it becomes a routine and lifestyle. That's discipleship. Discipleship is not haphazard. Uh -uh. It's not haphazard. Okay? And it's very important for you to know here in Power City, our emphasis is on campuses. Campuses. So, your, your, your relevance an impact will only be felt within your local campus. See, you can't be floating around. I am, over, I am overseeing campuses. There's no such office. You must belong to a local campus, a body of believers, where you are raising disciples and influencing the kingdom of God and impacting your immediate community. You must belong. Facebook is a starting point, but we go beyond Facebook to local gatherings. On Facebook, nobody can hold you accountable. There's no military in the world that is trained on Facebook. There's no military training online. They take them to a location and train them on site. If the secular don't train their soldiers like that, why would, should we train the soldiers of the gospel like that? There's a reason why you don't train soldiers online. Because there are trainings that you cannot do online. Same thing with ministry. 
Same thing with ministry. So that's why it must belong to a local assembly. Where people gather. Where somebody holds you accountable. Where somebody checks on you. Brother, you were not in prayer the other day. What's happening? You never miss prayer, but you miss prayer this other day. Please, let it not happen again. You know that there are people looking up to you. So that checks you. Are we in the building? Yes, sir. And you need a physical guard where somebody will step on your toe. And build some character into you. <laughs> Is it not true? Step on your toe. And then you remove your toe and tell him sorry. He stepped on your toe, but you're the one telling him sorry. Character is growing. <laughs> yes, we need physical gathering. God's plan for the church is physical gathering. That's why it says he, he takes the solitary and places them in families. Physical gatherings. Social media is starting point. But when you have understood what we're saying on social media, the next desire will be to have a local body where you have brethren you pray together with. Brethren, you evangelize with. Brethren, you disciple people with. You can't be on social media forever. The other day, Facebook went down. <laughs> it may go down again. There's no guarantee that it won't go down again. Do you have any guarantee? No. Did you know it will go down? No. WhatsApp went down. Everything went down. And everyone was like, ah, what's going on? Is this the end of the world? How can Facebook be the end of the world? See how addicted you are? So that's why beyond Facebook and social media, we must have physical gatherings. So that even if social media goes down for one month, we are not affected. Because we already have ourselves. See, I hear you. That's why you must belong to a physical body. And together we can go pray for the sick in hospitals. Together we can go reach out to a community close by. Together we can go. We are not limited. But you can't do some of that on social media. You can't. You can't raise leaders on social media. Re leaders will be raised physically. There are many things. Accountability, faithfulness can only be confirmed physically. Because somebody can put his name on social media, you know, when I'm preaching, he just put his name and say, wonderful. And that is all he said. And left his page on and went away. You'll be thinking he's there. He's not there. After 45 minutes, he comes back wonderful. <laughs> he goes away. <laughs> We're men of like passion. So, but you can physically in church, you can't do wonderful and go out. We know you went out. So there's effective supervision. Somebody say supervision. So that's why Paul would say the Holy Ghost has made them overseers because there's a, supervision, there's a supervisory role required in the local assembly. People have to oversee you. It's safe for you. Say, I hear you. It's very safe. It's very safe. Some say, but I used to be in a church and I was abused in that church. That's why I left church. Let me just be on social media. What's the guarantee that I will not be abused again? Even on social media, they will abuse you. In fact, the abuses on social media are beyond recovery. Because the people abusing you, you will never see them and they will never see you. So they can abuse you recklessly. <laughs> there are bullies on social media. They just bully you, bully you, bully you. So for you to be on social media, you must have thick skin. So when they bully you, you bully them back and tell them, stop that nonsense. Stop that. But if you're chicken hearted, don't go there. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bullying arena, especially Facebook. You're preaching, somebody will just say, heresy. He didn't even hear what you said. Heresy. <laughs> then you type, define heresy. <laughs> then he keeps quiet because he doesn't even know the meaning. <laughs> a bully is all over there. <laughs> it's a war zone. <laughs> Are you here? So that's why we need a local assembly where we grow, where we are able to take care of each other, pray for each other, and raise more people for the kingdom and be mission-minded and drive the purpose of God together. Praise God. I said praise God. I said praise God. So what, what we teach is the gospel, the message. Okay? Now, who do we disciple? Number one, those we win who are fruits of our preaching. We disciple those we win. 
Number two, those we meet by the roadside who are either confused or unlearned. They may be members of other churches, but they are confused. So we grab them and disciple them. They could be members of other churches, but they are not learning. So we grab them and disciple them. Are you understanding? Number three, believers who have learned other things, like Apollos. Believers who know about how to make it, how to survive post-COVID. 21st century digital, digital strategies for economic relevance. They know all of that, but they don't know Christ. So we grab them and disciple them. They are members in the class of Apollos. Mighty in scripture, knowing only the baptism of John. Number four, those carried away by other gospels. Never as a believer see meeting people and connecting with people as accidental. Never. When you meet people, see beyond that meeting to what God can make out of that meeting. When you meet people. Do you understand what I said? See beyond that immediate meeting and see what God is able to make out of that meeting. So you don't treat meeting people casual. You connect. You build relationships. And then you carry out the mission within those relationships. Is it, is it, is it working? Are you, are you catching this? Now, you know Apollos, right? What do I disciple with? What do I disciple people with? Number one, visit. You go to them. Visit. You go to them steadily. Consistently as much as they can make themselves available, even if it's every day. Number two, you give them teaching materials. Buy my books. Buy my books. That would be a good way to start discipleship. You buy my book, you tell the person, I'd like you to read this book, and when you're through, call me. I want us to discuss it. That's a good way to start. So get books, give to them. Get my messages, give to them. Send it to them. Tell them, listen to it. When you're through, let's discuss. That's the way to start. You're communicating. So you are not making them look like you're the one who is trying to disciple them. You're making them look like there's something I stumbled on, and I think you may be interested but eventually, you're the one that will disciple them. So you just push me forward. Let me get the bullets. And then you come and clean up the place. <laughs> you say, who is this man? What is he talking about? Say, I'm telling you, that's why I want us to discuss. <laughs> me to the first time I had it, that's exactly my reaction. Can we meet? <laughs> Are you with me here? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's where to go. That's where to go. You take one of my short, wicked videos. God has never killed. God does not kill. God will never kill. What? Is this man a man of God? In fact, that's why I want us to meet. I don't know whether he's a man of God or till we meet. <laughs> Sin can never take a man to hell. Bob, what? <laughs> Are you in the building? That's the way to go. So teaching materials. And of course, Facebook posts. Facebook posts, Facebook videos, you know. Some of you know you do business on your Facebook page so you can create a new Facebook page for the gospel. Just like you created one for your business, you can create one for the gospel. And all you do there is put the videos, put the messages, and stay there building net a network of relationships. When they come up and make a comment, chase them to their inbox and say, I think you have a point. Can we discuss? Don't answer them on the page. Chase them into the inbox because there they will not be guarded. On the page, they'll be defensive. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't engage them on the page. Go into their inbox and then engage them privately. They will open up. Very important. All right? Now, online radio, YouTube channel, our materials on YouTube channel, you know, and um, all of that. Now, things to do as we teach. Things we do as we begin to raise disciples. Number one, prayerfully teach. Prayerfully. Paul kept praying. The eyes of your understanding may lighten in Ephesians chapter 1. 
So you can write down the prayers to pray for people as you are raising them as disciples. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 to 23. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 to 20. Ephesians 3 14 to 20. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 to 11. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 to 11. Philippians 1 9 to 11. Colossians 1 9 to 11. Philemon. 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 Six. They are all prayers for discipleship. Brother Paul did not only rely on teachings. He gave time to pray. So when you are raising disciples, pray, 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 teach. Pray, 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 teach. Pray, 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 teach. And of course, pray with them. Teach them to pray together with you one hour, two hours, three hours. Pray with your disciple. Let him understand how to pray well through the way you pray. Don't just tell disciples pray. No, go to them. Tell them today is prayer meeting. We're going to pray for one hour. Let's pray. And if they don't have the Holy Spirit, get them to speak in tongues. Get them baptized with the Holy Ghost. Let them speak with tongues. Because when they speak with tongues, they pray without restriction. All that is discipleship. Then number two, carefully teach. You must teach with care. Precept upon precept, line upon line. And when they ask you questions, don't make a mockery at their questions. You must be patient. Don't say, uh-uh. Why are you asking this kind of question? No, no, no. Don't embarrass them. When they ask a question, treat it as important. You know, say, oh, yeah. That question is really, really intelligent. Yeah. All right. So this is the answer. You boost their morale to ask more questions. And when they are asking more questions, their interest is growing. But when you are teaching and they are quiet and looking at you, say any question, they say nothing. Start praying. <laughs> Start praying. Because something dangerous may be coming. Because when people are just listening and saying nothing. Are you understanding? Mm? Are you here? Mm? Do you have any say? Mm? Any question? Mm? And you are praying and saying in Jesus' name, they are not saying amen. That's quiet. <laughs> you better pray. You better pray. <laughs> Number three, teach. Because some people do everything else, but they don't teach. They go to hospital, give them new clothes. New clothes, banana, oranges are not the main thing. So even if you give him new clothes, as he's wearing the new clothes, let him be wearing it with doctrine. <laughs> Also, you, number four, you cannot disciple without example. So in discipleship, you must lead by example. Please, that's key. Lead by example. If you want your students to read the Bible, you read the Bible, let them see you read. If you want them to make notes, show them your own notes. Let them see that you two are making notes. If you want them to pray, pray with them. Teach by example. Anything that is without example is hypocritical leadership. They must see you do what you're asking them to do. And when you go for evangelism with them, of course, after a while, when you know they have understood what you're saying, make them preach while you listen. And tell them if there's any issue, I'm here to support you. You do the preaching. Because you're training him. Don't be the one preaching because you're full of Greek and Hebrew. Let him preach. You keep quiet. Then when he's through preaching, you can add whatever was missing. To what he has said. And as he's listening, he's taking note of what you added. The next time he preaches, some of those things he will add them. Before you know it, he is doing it well. Yeah. Critical. Take them on the job. And when they ask questions, you look at them. Is this something you want to answer? If they have the answer, they will say yes. If they say no, you say okay, let me answer. You answer. You keep checking. And if they want to answer, let them answer. If the answer is not complete, don't say that is wrong. Just say, just like you have said, let me add to what you have said. And then as you are adding, you are correcting everything. It's part of training. You grow them. And when you grow them, then you won't do the job alone. You will have a team that is doing the job with you. Praise God. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Common sense things to do in raising disciples. Common sense things. You spend your money. You spend your money. That's the first common sense thing to do. 
Before you tell him to buy my material, buy for him. Before you tell him to listen to my message, buy the first set. Tell him, listen to this. And say, you can buy more after he has listened. Buy him a Bible if he doesn't have one. It's an investment in eternity. The way you will know that he is growing is that he will start doing the things you're doing for him. Instead of asking you to buy, he will buy. Before you know it, he will buy for him and buy for you. See that? That's the way it works. Don't tell him go and buy. Buy giving. Buy giving. You come for a conference like this, you see materials, buy one too. Say, I went to a conference, we just came back, I got these books for you. Read them. And when you're done, let's discuss. That's the way to do it. That's how you raise people. Are you with me here? That's why you raise people. You start a new campus. You come to a conference like this. You buy books for every one of them in the campus. When you go back, you tell them, I'm going to throw the books. You grab the one that is yours. You throw the books, and all of them are excited, and they're happy. Read it. Let's discuss. Everybody reads. You discuss. The campus is growing. They, too, when they go for conferences like this, they will buy books for others because that's how you taught them. So before you know it, you have a reading culture in your campus. Everybody's reading, everybody's buying books, and everybody's committed to it. You're raising healthy disciples. Are we in the building? Yes, so you spend your money. That's common sense thing to do in raising disciples. Because the bedrock of Christian leadership is exemplary Christian living. You must not be found in certain places as a leader raising disciples. Your dressing, your courage, your speech, your appearance must look like one to be copied. Your speech, your dressing, your courage, your appearance. For the sake of your disciple, you come to church early. If service starts at 6, you are there 10 before 6, 10 minutes to 6. And as you enter, he is watching you. You pray. You pray. Even if you didn't feel like praying, somebody's watching you. Kabata, kabata. Somebody says, is that no eye service? It is good eye service because you're using it to train somebody. Do you understand? Yeah. Sometimes you sit on the pulpit. There are things we don't want to do, but we do it because everybody's watching. Everybody's watching you. You're the pastor and they're watching your body language. You didn't feel like it, but you have to do it because you are teaching people. Yeah. You feel like sleeping? You keep your eye like this. <laughs> they will think you are seeing vision. You're not understanding what they're saying. You're waving your hands. Because you want everybody to be in the spirit. They may understand. You may not. So let's end. Whatever. Let's just be blessed. Everybody should pray. You stand up. Go back. You are, you are steering people in a direction. Before you know it, that campus is on fire. When they say prayer, the whole place is on fire because the leader set the pace for the campus to be on fire. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Say, let us pray. And you're there. Your whole campus will be full of. In fact, some will not do anything. Because if you're a pastor, you're only. Shuka, shuka. I have tried for just doing like this. I could have opened my hand be looking at all of you. <laughs> Glory to God. Are we communicating? In raising disciples, in building a campus, and building God's people, these are common sense things to do. Evangelism, you are not there, and you want them to evangelize. You are a joker. Prayer meeting, you come late. You are a joker. You teach them to pray while they are praying, you sleep. <laughs> they finish praying and they are waiting for you. Somebody will come and say, Pastor, we are finished. <laughs> 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 
discipling a new convert is our responsibility, and we must take that responsibility very serious. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. All right, so when we come back, I will deal with practical things to know when pioneering a campus. When we come back, okay? So, questions from anybody before I pray? Okay, there are hands. Today's class has questions. <laughs> Today's class has questions. It's good. Okay. Uh, I can questions. Let me see how I can answer them as quick as possible before we leave. Beginning from. Yeah, good. Good. Thank you, Pastor. Bless you. <laughs> Uh, my question, I want to be quick. My question, you said in service today that uh, Paul's revelation knowledge far exceeded just education. My question is this. Paul himself was a Pharisee, a leader of the Pharisees. Did his knowledge of the scriptures prior have any effect on his revelation knowledge? Or are they, they're, are they the, they're not, not the same? Not really. He had to collapse the whole thing. I yeah, count it as dung. Okay. Yeah. So he had to start afresh okay. because he was a Pharisee. And you know, the Pharisee way of teaching is not sound doctrine. Right. They teach with the tradition of men. So it didn't help at all. If, if, if anything, it actually even made it difficult for him. Sometimes it's better not to have known anything than to know the wrong things. Okay. So he truly just got rid he of it. Totally, totally. Okay. Everything. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. A question came in on uh, paper. It yes. It says, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, 41, that hell was created specifically for Satan and his boys. Yes. My question is, when was hell specifically created, if the Bible mentioned it? Was it before or after the fall of man? It was created in the foreknowledge of God. If God is God, he should have seen the end from the beginning and the, end and the beginning from the end. And he should have known there would be a need for hell. So ahead of time, he created it. Just like Jesus was the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth. So it was created in God's foreknowledge. But, but will take effect at the time of judgment. Amen. Oh. Okay. Greetings, Pastor Abel. Good morning. Um, I know I've heard before about hindrance. So my question is how, because you said to Pray that the message is not hindered. Yes. How can the message be hindered? First of all, people's minds blocked. Number two, religion. You know, religion, religious spirits. People who think they know everything. Before you quote a scripture, they quote it for you, but out of context. Mm -hmm. So you can't really get ahead with them because they already know everything. Mm. That's a hindrance. So all of those are the hindrances. Yeah. Another question on paper. It says... Um, should a person who claimed to be a holy uh, to be holy ghost filled be a homosexual and lead the worship team in worship? Oh yes, it's possible. It's possible. Homosexuality does not allow a man from receiving the Holy Ghost. Just like the sins of men they didn't stop Jesus from dying. Homosexuality is in the same class with lies. And it's in the same class with anger. And it's in the same class with unforgiveness. It's only in your head that is big. <laughs> but before God sin is sin, there's no classification. So if you're lying and you still speak in tongues, then a homosexual can be speaking in tongues and leading worship. He's suffering from identity crisis. As he grows in revelation knowledge, the appetite will disappear. All these guys who say, I feel like a woman, is identity crisis. It's in the mind. Your emotions are controlled by the mind. Do you follow my series? Yes, sir. You following the inward witness? Yes, sir. That's a series where we have all of these classes. Once you're exposed to new information, your emotions change. So we expose them to the truth in Christ, and they get out of homosexuality. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. Um, my question is in regards to discipleship. As a female, how do I disciple the male? 
how do I draw the lines in regards to dissertation, constant testing, and all of that. Next session. I'm going to get into all of that in the next session. Very good question. Very good question. Okay, so uh, oh, that was very quick. Um, there's this guy called New Ross. He was old oh, Testament. Yeah. yeah. There, there's this other guy called Terra, yeah. which is the father of Abraham. Yeah. He has two sons, Haram and Abraham. Yes. Now, Haram was killed because the father was a general in their in that setting of Nimrod. Now, Haram was killed. Haram has Sarah yep. and uh, Lot. Yep. If I'm wrong, just correct me, please. Mm -hmm. sir. Mm -hmm. Now, Abraham married Sarah. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want you to say, because I think a lot of people are watching us, tell, say whether it's right or wrong, but I need you to advise me. For me, I say if God did not punish them then, then I think it's not an offense. Or I know societally is bad. To marry your cousin. Yeah. I know churchically, if, it's, if there is no English like that, I put it. <laughs> I know churchically is bad. Family Kali is bad. Societally is bad. Uh, is bad. But godically, culturally what is bad. <laughs> so, please, sir. Godically, we are silent. Where godically is silent, and we are loud where godically is loud. loud. Amen. <laughs> I hope it's clear. Good afternoon, Papa. Afternoon. Um, yes, uh, wonderful to have you again with us, sir. Thank you. Uh, so the question I have is for a friend of mine. He's actually watching on Zoom. Okay, good. Um, it's on Holy Communion. I've tried to explain. He believes everything. He loves everything you say, but Minus Holy, Holy, Com <laughs> Holy Communion. <laughs> well, brother, that, is that all? Yeah, because he's like, uh, yeah, the Bible yeah. says um, that Do this Jesus in remembrance said, of me. Yes, in the remembrance of me, exactly. I, I, I think you should buy for him the book on the on communion table. Communion table, yes. That whole book was sought him permanently forever. Because that's all I did on that book, the communion table. But just for the purpose of those that may not have access to the book, the communion table. The first thing is, there's no word like holy communion in the Bible. Genesis to Revelation. You won't find it anywhere. So the word Holy Communion was a coinage of the Catholic Church. It's not in the Bible. Pentecostal just copied it. Because first of all, I'm a Pentecostal by upbringing. The Pentecostals don't really have a theology. The Pentecostals just copy theologies from everywhere to combine to form Pentecostalism. That's why in Pentecostalism, anything goes almost. Okay, now, so the word com Holy Communion it's not in the Bible. That means it has no Bible teaching. What we have in the Bible is the Passover, a feast of the Jews. And that is the same Passover that Jesus attended in Luke, where he said to them, I will no more eat this with you until that day in my father's kingdom. And don't forget, that feast did not start with Jesus. It started with Moses. In Exodus. Because that was Moses' teaching ministry. To communicate death, burial, and resurrection to Jewish people. Okay? And it was a feast. It was not just bread and wine. It was four cups of wine. Bread, spices, and all kinds of stuff. And it was a well-prepared ceremony. And even the bread was unleavened. So there was every, it was a big feast. In Israel. Now, so Jesus joined them to the Mount of, before they went to the Mount of Olives and had the last one. Okay? Now, Jesus dies, but he tells them, I will eat this with you. He rose from the dead. And there was no more practice of Passover in Acts of the Apostles. Breaking bread is love feast. It's not Passover. The Lord's Supper is dinner. It's not Passover. So there's a difference between Passover, the Lord's uh, breaking of bread, and the Lord's Supper. They are not the same. The confusion people have is that they, they see all of them as the same, but they are not the same. You won't see their practice in the book of Acts. So that means as the church began to grow, nobody practiced it. So somebody's argument will be, but brother Paul 
in First Corinthians 11 says, I received of the Lord Jesus that which I also delivered unto you. How that in that night when he was betrayed, he took bread and he took wine. And he says, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Okay? So brother Paul was not teaching the rebranded Holy Communion. Brother Paul was teaching love among the brethren, using the Passover as an analogy to teach love. Okay? So, in understanding that, we have to contextually study the book of Corinthians to establish what I just said. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, put it up for me, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, Purge out therefore the old living, that ye may be a new lump, as you are unliving. For even Christ our Passover. Christ So Christ is now our Passover. Passover is no more bread and wine. Passover is a person. When you receive Christ, you received eternal Passover. Are you following? Now, observe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 before 11, Brother Paul began to talk about the body. The body. Began to talk about love in the body. He said, all of us are one bread. All of us are one bread. So the bread is no more something from a bakery. We are the bread. We are the body. We are the bread. What made us the bread? We are joined to the bread. Jesus is the bread and the wine. When we became joined to him, we became one bread. After talking about being one bread, he now said, however, how is it that when you come together and you say you're coming for the Lord's Supper, some are filled and some are hungry. What kind of Lord's Supper is that? That you come together to eat. Some are filled and some are hungry. He said, I praise you not. You are not coming together to edification but to condemnation. Then he now said, I receive of the Lord Jesus. Where did he receive it? Not from Jesus but from brother Luke. From Luke. Okay, Luke's account. How that in that night, he took bread and he broke it. And after explaining that, he now says, when you come together, you are not coming together to edify, but you are coming together to compete. Some eat, some are hungry. And he says, if you are hungry, eat at home. Don't come here to fill your hungry stomach. Our coming here is to eat together so that everybody has something to eat. He's dealing with love. Then he now says, because you do not discern the Lord's body. What is the body of the Lord? All of us. Because we do not discern one another, some of us are weak. Some of us are sick. Some of us die. Why do we die? A brother is sick. Other brethren are not sensitive to go and find out how are you? Are you able to pay your hospital bills? Were you able to be treated? What are you doing with yourself? We ignore him until he dies because we didn't take care of him are you all following it? if communion kills all of us will have been dead now we will have all eaten and dead have you ever read where anybody ate the bread and the wine and dropped dead and then they will say but the bible says you should not eat on wordily. the person that needs that bread and wine is a sinner because the body and the bread the bread and the blood was shed for sin. The person that should eat it is the sinner that is struggling with sin. But then they now say, if you are in sin, you shouldn't eat it. Uh -uh. Is it afraid of sin? Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense. So, what Paul was teaching there was love within the brethren. And how to take care of one another. However, if you get the book on the, the communion table, I did exegesis from Genesis to Revelation on everything that has to do with communion, Passover, supper, love feast, with exegesis and the original words. 
you, you have to look at the book here, the communion table. Okay? It's a full book on just that doctrine because we need to clarify it. Mm. Is it clear, brother? Well, I'm, I'm sure the brother is watching and uh, he will get the book and it will help him a lot. Yeah. Question back here. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, bless you. Thank you very much as always, Doc. So I have a quick question. Um, it's in relation to the local church. Okay. Um, how do you treat such situ um, situation wherein you have a brother or a sister that is homosexual, right? Yep. Well, they said they have accepted the message. Yes. They are gifted. Yes. Should we or should we not allow them, for example, sing in the choir, play no, instruments? No, no, no. How, you do you, how do you go about dealing with such That situations? is putting the cat before the horse. A brother comes to church, is born again, and I discover he's a homosexual. He needs me to disciple him. So I'll draw him close and disciple him. In the process of discipleship, all that nonsense will stop. By the time I'm done discipling him, he's fit to, to be a worship leader. <laughs> yes. Yes. When you bombard him with proper discipleship. No. That means he has not understood, understood the protocol of that church. You don't come to church for leadership. You come to church to know Christ. Once that culture is established, when they come in, they will fit in. So you have to emphasize that culture. Here in this church, we don't come here for leadership or service. We come here to sit and learn of Christ. Amen. That's, you must establish that. Yes, you talk. Sorry, you say it every service. You keep announcing it till it sinks in that this is the culture of this church. The first thing you come here to do is to learn Christ. Yes. So don't come here with the thought of service. We don't want you to serve till you learn Christ. Yes. Look at what Jesus says. Matter, matter. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. care and matter about so many things. One thing is needful. And your sister has chosen the better part. What is the better part? Sit down and take notes. So that must be the emphasis. Once they understand that, nobody will think of service and leadership. All they will be thinking of is learning. But as they are learning and growing, we are appointing leaders among them. Is that clear? Yes. Next question. Uh, praise God, Pastor. My question is, what is the difference between angels and the Holy Spirit and the difference in their responsibilities? Wow, you need a lot of foundational teachings. <laughs> because... Because what you are asking requires a lot of foundational teaching. So the first thing for you to do is to know Jesus. When you know Jesus, it will be easy for you to know the difference between the Holy Spirit and angels. Because when you know Jesus, you will know that Jesus is God who became a man to save man. And upon his resurrection, became the Holy Spirit to live in us. Angels are servants sent to serve the purpose of God on our behalf. That's the difference. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is Jesus in spirit form living in us. Angels are servants created to serve God's purpose on our behalf. I hope that helps you. But, but you need a lot of teaching. So my advice, whoever asks that question, my advice is get on YouTube and start looking at the things I teach on YouTube and patiently follow all the teachings. You will come to the knowledge of the truth. Bless you. We're going to put a pause on questions for now so that we can, in the evening session, we'll take more questions. Thank you. Moreover, if you have questions, you write them. So that way, if they're written in the evening, it will be easy for us to read them quickly and answer them and uh, have a more organized thing. Now, please listen to me before you go. We're about to close. But just before we close, please listen carefully. It's important you know. Have you really enjoyed the conference? What do you picture happening one year from now? Uh? Explosion everywhere, right? Church planting, church growth. Disciples raised. The gospel covering this nation like never before. Somebody's not shouting a powerful amen. Well, we have coordinators who went through our coordinators training season and they have graduated. 
and I'm supposed to just get certificates to them today. These are coordinators who are going to be launching new campuses. And as a ministry, usually we train coordinators, and at the end of training, we release them to start new campuses. And if you're here, you're new, you want to be a coordinator, you want us to train you, you want to start a campus, you want to undergo our training process and start a Power City campus, when the service is over, please indicate to Pastor Jessica. Pastor Jessica will make sure you're in touch. You know you get in touch. You know, I have not said anything about partnership since I came because my heart is more on training you to do the work of ministry. But part of the work of ministry is partnership. What partnership actually does is it enables you to reach out to us prayerfully and financially. So that because all the things we do all over the world, all the things we do all over the world is capital intensive. It costs money to do a lot of things. You know, for example, coming to this conference, some sisters came together and paid for our tickets to come and be a blessing to you. See that? If that didn't happen, maybe it would have been a bit challenging to get us to come here. So it costs money to do the things we do all over the world. When you partner with us, what you do is you make our work easy. You're able to give us what you are able to afford. There's no figure on it. You know, you partner with us. Some of you have companies here. Your company can partner with us. And because we're a charity organization, we can give you your tax re re return, whatever. You know, yeah, your tax exemption, whatever you require, we can do that. And you can support what we do, and we're able to do much more in this country and around the world. So you can partner with us as a person, and your company can partner with us. And you can support what we do. You may also have friends who have companies and corporations that may be willing to support a righteous cause like this. You can also talk to them and encourage them to partner with this ministry. It's very important. The more monies we get, the more we can push this gospel. Listen carefully. The other gospel, the other gospel has been able to raise so much money and make so much noise everywhere. Yeah. If we're going to push the other gospel out of people's lives, it will cost much more. You remember when Jesus rose from the dead, the Jews paid, the Bible says they brought bags of money and gave to these Roman soldiers to go all over Israel and convince Jewish people that Jesus never rose. The money was so much that they convinced almost everybody. That's why in Israel today, they are still waiting for the Messiah. Money was used to shut the mouth of the gospel. Which means it will require much more money to open the mouth of the gospel. To get the gospel out there. So, that's why we ask people to partner. The more people we have partnering and supporting what we do every month, the more effective we become, the more we can get this gospel around the world. And even where you're launching campuses, it will be easy for people in that community to have heard me preach. So by the time you're launching, you already have a number of people there that have heard the gospel that are willing to be part of your campus. So that way we, it's easy for us to break forth all over the nations of the earth. That's what partnership does. And as you partner with us, you become a partaker of the grace of this ministry. And when we appear before Jesus, it's not only Dr. Damina that will be rewarded. Because you partnered and through your giving, I did the much I did, you also partake in the reward that I will get from Jesus. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So that's why we ask for partnership. And I want to thank those of you who are already partners of this ministry. And those of you who continue to partner. And those of you who are deciding. You have sufficiency in all things. You are bound unto every good work. God supplies all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Supernatural favor is upon you. Supernatural relationships, ideas, concepts, and insights to do much more, make more money, do more businesses, and do more for the gospel. Father, we give you praise. Now, Satan, I rebuke you. Take your hands off the resources of God's people. Take your hands off in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for favor. Thank you for grace. And thank you for the blessing. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. All right, so if you want to partner, they have forms. They are taking around. If you just stretch your hand, they will bring a form to you. You fill the form. The form gets back to us. We will send you a letter from our office acknowledging your partnership with all the information that you require to effectively partner with us. And like I always say, every dime you send into this ministry, myself, we take no salary from this ministry. So don't be afraid to send us your money. It's not coming to our pocket. We don't take no salary. Many years ago when we started pastoring Power City, we made a decision 
that we will not want to take any salary from this church. We want God to take care of us. And he's been faithfully taking care of us. So every dime you send into our ministry goes back into the ministry. All the books I write, all the monies that come in for the purchase of books are supposed to come to my pocket because it's my intellectual property. But my wife and myself, we decided to sacrifice everything that comes in through all the books I have written back into this ministry because we want to get this gospel to the ends of the earth. So when you give to this ministry, every dollar you give into this ministry goes back into evangelism. And we are very accountable. We have transparency in our accounting system. You can be very sure your money is safe and your money is well utilized. And we are good managers of every dollar because we negotiate very seriously before we spend a dime. Because we are going to be accountable to the Lord Jesus for the monies that we give to this ministry. So you have no worries, you have no fears when it comes to what your money will be used for. It will be used very, very excellently in the advancement of the purpose of God on the earth. I don't know if that is clear. It's important I put that clarity out there. All right. <clears throat> That's why sometimes you will see people will come to me and say, Dr. Damina, I want to give you money, but I want you to eat it. Because... <laughs> They know that when you give me money, it goes back. They know it back in church. They will bring money to me and say, listen, listen, Papa, listen. This money, chop it. Go and thank me and say, but this one you can put the minister, this one chop it. <laughs> because they know that our heart is the gospel. You know, we're not looking for more clothes to wear. We're not looking for more shoes to put on. We're not looking for a house to lie on. God has given us a house where we live in. Uh, I don't need three cars. Even one car can occupy the seats in it. I can only sit in one section of the car. You know, we have contentment in Christ. So everything you send goes back into the gospel. That's the point I am making. Because the gospel is what we are all out for. And that's what we live for. Can I have a good amen? amen. So that's just to, you know, put that out. I, I want to quickly acknowledge the new coordinators, Pastor Jessica. If you can call them out. Doc, honey, come so we do it together. We just shake your hands and then we put the certificates in your hands. All the new coordinators. And all the new coordinators want you to know we love you. We're so glad that you're a part of our team. We want to welcome all of you to the team. We have a lot to do and we're excited that God has added you to our number to get the gospel around the nations of the earth. Right? Amen. So the first person on the list is uh, Oluwa Sheun. That is a coordinator for Maryland Campus. Congratulations. Congratulations. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. And the second person on the list is uh, Sister Allega from Atlanta Campus. And the first brother on my list is Brother Mbateke from Houston Campus. <laughs> and unfortunately, the three I have left, I have a brother Fabrics from the Canada Campus. He's unable to travel. So, Papa, I will hold on to it. Fabrice, congratulations. <laughs> Another person I have is Sister Susan Bello. Sister Susan is here from Connecticut campus. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. And the final name I have is also from the Canada campus, Sister Sarah. Unfortunately, she's not here. Um, one of the brethren from Canada will, be, will take it to them. 
Well, Sister Sarah, if you're watching, congratulations. Bless you. Bless you, bless okay. you, bless you. So, you will take it for Sarah. Okay, very so, good. So stand very good. Oh, Papa. oh, praise God. Well, let's clap for them again. Thank you. <laughs> Glory. Glory. Amen. Amen. Grab your offering. Let's give us your worship on our way out of this place. We give in faith. We give in joy. Give, we give intentionally and deliberately because we know that our money is going to push the purpose of God on the earth. We give also in honor of the labor of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Father, thank you for everybody giving this morning, men, women. Thank you for sisters and brothers, hearts steered up by the Holy Ghost. We are willing in this day of your power. And as we release our resources to advance your cause on the earth, I decree that the needs of your people are met supernaturally and our offering is a sweet smell before you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. All right, the, the envelopes are going around. You grab your envelope, package your offerings in and drop them in the baskets with the brethren that are coming around to take the offerings. And um, like I said, tonight, 6 p.m., grab a friend, grab somebody, bring everybody you can find tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm, still I'm still looking at maybe I'll do impartations tonight or tomorrow morning in the Sunday service. So either of the two, depending on how, uh, you know, how the Spirit of God leads me, we could have impartations tonight or tomorrow in the final service. Impartations are very important. Brother Paul says that long. You know, you, 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 you come with an open heart. You come expecting. There are so many deposits of God on your inside. When we lay hands on you, they are stirred up and brought into manifestation. So expect great things as we fellowship tonight, 6 p.m. And tomorrow morning, what time is the service in the morning tomorrow? 9 a.m. So all of you watching. With your time. <laughs> Glory. 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 